Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention? I will begin the Fort Knox community listening session in about five minutes. Please silence your electronic devices. I'm doing the obligatory, please silence your electronic devices speech here. But you have about five minutes uh, as people settle in. Uh, we'll get started here real soon. And uh, we are so happy to see everybody here tonight. So thank you so much. We'll get started real, real soon. Thank you.
and the crowd grew silent. All right, welcome. How's everyone doing tonight? All right, big uh, Fort Knox and Kentucky welcome. Uh, thanks again for being here tonight. Uh, what a wonderful crowd, and uh, thanks for being here for the Fort Knox Community Listening Session. Uh, just in case you didn't, you weren't here for that, this is what this is, a Fort Knox Community Listening Session. And uh, my name is Colonel T.J. Edwards. I am the uh, garrison commander out at Fort Knox, and uh, very proud to say that, uh, kind of like the local mayor out there, the garrison commander. And tonight, I'm going to be serving as your facilitator. And uh, with me on stage tonight is, of course, my boss, Major General Peggy Combs, who's the commanding general of the U.S. Army Cadet Command in Fort Knox. And to her left are three individuals from the Pentagon, uh, Mr. John McLaurin, the Deputy Director for the Department of the Army Force Management Office. Mr. McLaurin is in what we call in the military a SES. You know we like our acronyms in the military, uh, which stands for Senior Executive Service, and he's among the highest ranking civilians in the Department of Defense in, in the Army. Also with Mr. McLaurin is Force Management Office Station Integrator uh, Colonel Tom O'Donohue, and Mr. Andy Nap Napoli is Assistant for BRAC for the Department of the Army. I'd like to thank uh, you gentlemen for being with us here, um, and you beat the Washington, D.C. weather to get here. They have a little snow out there, so it's still cold for Kentucky, but uh, we welcome you here to uh, the great, great Commonwealth. And I'd be remiss if I did not uh, publicly thank Hardin County School Superintendent uh, I think Nanette Johnston is here. Are you here out there? Right there. Uh, thank you so much. This is, is this not a wonderful facility? This is really, really outstanding. Thank you so much. And we very much appreciate that support. Now to kick this, this session off, I'd like to first welcome Mr. McLaurin to provide some opening remarks. Mr. McLaurin. Thank you, TJ. I, I'm just going to take a minute uh, to, well, first of all, I want to thank Ms. Johnson, of course, for allowing us to use this beautiful facility here. It, I've never seen anything like it. it is, you all are very fortunate and lucky to have it here. It's wonderful. Uh, second, I would like to thank General Combs and her excellent team. Uh, they have uh, gone out of their way to make sure that uh, we had everything that we needed uh, and that we're actually here tonight. And lastly, I'd like to thank all of you for being here tonight. Uh, both the secretary and the chief, uh, as well as me myself, are, think that this venue is extremely important to the process that we're going through right now. And we sincerely want to hear from you and what your concerns are and what your thoughts are. Uh, I know that uh, there's time planned for this tonight, but uh, please understand that we really do want to hear from you and that uh, I and my team here will be here till we finish tonight. Uh, we care about Fort Knox, we care about your communities, and we care about you and what you do have to say. So thank you again for having us here tonight. Uh, we difficult subject, but we're pleased to be here and pleased to hear what you have to say. So thank you again for your hospitality. Thank you very much, sir. Now, in just a few minutes, Colonel Tom O'Donohue will provide you a brief overview of the Army stationing decision process, and then I will give an overview of how the listening uh, uh, portion tonight will be conducted. This will promote greater understanding of this topic while also being sure to collectively carry out this session in an efficient and an effective manner. Right now, I'd, I'd like to welcome my boss, uh, Major General Peggy Combs, up to the stage to give a few remarks. Ma'am. All right, welcome friends and neighbors. Can we get a hoo? All right, we're fired up. Um, thank you so much for coming out here this evening. And most importantly, thank you for what you do each and every day to support our great army, our soldiers, our civilians, and our contractors that all work on Fort Knox. You know, we so much appreciate you and this outpouring of support this evening. And as you all know, in response to the supplemental programmatic uh, environmental assessment known as the SPEE, um, you all wrote 
14,135 letters. And you know, you gotta say, that's pretty hua, you know, from my standpoint. You know, I, I was kind of like, wow, you know, our small little community, that finished fourth out of 30 installations. So y'all give yourselves a hand. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I will tell you, uh, tonight we are here uh, to listen to you, and ap actually this great team here will take back everything that you say and present it to Army decision makers as they have many tough choices ahead. I think most of you know the Army really does have to cut 40 more thousand folks out of its force structure. Um, the first, out of the first wave of reductions, we felt that pretty hard here at Fort Knox with the inactivation of our great BCT, 3-1. But, you know, we've got to do more. And so there are hard decisions out there ahead of our Army leadership. And that's why they invested the time with these three talented gentlemen to come out here and listen to the communities about what is important about this great installation that we have here in Kentucky called Fort Knox. What does set it apart strategically from other places as the Army does have to make its tough choices? And so I'd ask you tonight to, to please share your hua, share your love of the Army, and, and absolutely share your concerns. So thank you all for being here tonight. And uh, I got to tell you, I really think you are dedicated because I'm told that UK tips off at 7. <laughs> That's right, and you all are here, so hua. But, but thank you all for being here tonight, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, General Combs. Now I will ask Colonel o Tom O'Donohue to provide you with some background on the Army's force structure and stationing process. This is important because it shows how deliberate and thorough the Army is at working to arrive at the best, although very tough, as the CG just mentioned, decisions on a wide array of factors. Colonel O'Donohue. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I guess someone's controlling the slides up there. You get, next slide, please. That, yeah, okay, good. Well, I'll have to just... Uh, well, again, th thank you very much for coming here. Um, today's session really has, has two purposes. The first is to explain what the Army's doing and the process that, that we're going to use to reach some very, very difficult decisions. Um, that's what the next six slides that, I, that I'm going to present are designed to do. Now, the second purpose is more important. Washington, D.C. is about 500 miles from Fort Knox, kind of straight line as, as a crow flies. But when it comes to understanding Fort Knox and the surrounding communities, the distance can often be much greater than that. And one thing that I've learned in my 25 years in, in the Army is that there's no substitute for getting an assessment and input from the, the people on the ground that, like, that actually know the facts that are on the ground. Now, I suspect that it didn't take the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army 25 years to learn that lesson. They probably learned it much quicker. And that's why they sent us here today. Um, they sent us here to get your input your insights and carry that information back, carry that ground truth back to the Pentagon, to the senior leaders who are gonna make these difficult decisions and ensure that they're fully informed. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a quick uh, roadmap I'm on the next few slides that I've got. I'm planning on covering a few things. First is we announced uh, reductions back in the summer of 2013. So quick overview, what, what, we've, what we announced and, and where we've gone with that. Um, Second is, given the reductions we announced in 2013, why are we back talking about more reductions? Um, next, I'll talk about how the Army will make these, make decisions about future reductions. Uh, and in closing, I'll give some factors that the Army considers in its decision process. And then I'll turn it over to you for your input. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so what's happened so far? Kind of a recap. Um, the fiscal constraints of the 2011 Budget Control Act and strategic guidance that the Army received required the Army to reduce its active component and strength, its soldiers, from 570,000 down to 490,000 no later than October 2015. 
That's roughly 80,000 soldiers that we were you know, told we had to reduce. The details of this reduction were announced uh, in June of 2013, and those reductions are underway and will be complete in the next uh, nine or so months. Now, I don't have to tell you what, what it means, what these reductions meant. The loss of 3-1 here uh, has been felt, um, but not, not every installation actually you know, felt what, what Fort Knox has gone through. And, and there's a reason why. 80,000 is a lot of soldiers, but it wasn't as bad as it, as, as it could have been f across the Army, because uh, over 50,000 of those positions that were eliminated out of 80,000 weren't part of the Army structure here in the United States. About 11,000 soldiers came out of Europe, so U.S. installations didn't feel that. And another 32,000 soldiers weren't assigned to a particular installation. They were part of a temporary end strength increase and a wartime allowance so we could plus up units going to Afghanistan and Iraq. Now, now why do I say, why do I talk about that? It's not just a technicality, it's actually, you know, giving, giving folks an idea that the next round of cuts, you know, there's not going to be that, that little bit of mitigation available. It's going to be straight cutting units, again, sort of like you've experienced here at Fort Knox. Uh, next slide, please. Again, so after cutting 80,000 uh, active point of soldiers and more than 3,000 soldiers right here, um, why are we back? Why are we gearing up for another round of reductions so soon? Well, bottom line, it's the impact of the Budget Control Act. It, it, the Budget Control Act didn't end with the reduction of 80,000 soldiers that we announced in 2013. There's a second act to the Budget Control Act. It's called sequestration. And sequestration is the current law, so that's what we're, you know, we're, we're working under and working toward. And under sequestration, the Army's budget will be cut by an additional $95 billion. So what does this mean in terms of end strength for the Army? Well, the 2014 Quadrennial Defense Review spells it out you know, just in, in black and white. Uh, under, under um, the Army reduced its active duty end strength down to 450,000 soldiers by the end of fiscal year 2017. And that's a 21% reduction from our peak in 2010. And under full sequestration, unmitigated sequestration, which is the current law, the Army is required to continue to reduce its end strength below 450,000 soldiers, all the way down to 420,000 soldiers. And that's a reduction of 26%. Next slide, please. Now, reductions of this magnitude, we really didn't anticipate in 2013. So remember, sequestration was never supposed to really be triggered but it has been triggered, and that's why we had to produce a supplement. As you recall, we did a, a programmatic environmental assessment, or PEA, and now we were forced to go back and do a supplemental programmatic environmental assessment, assessing the impact of deeper cuts and including more installations. On, November, on 10 November, the Army G3 signed a finding of no significant impact, or FONSI, for the SPEA. That's um, and I just want to clarify that. I understand it can cause some confusion because the Army's own analysis shows the impact would be significant for three out of the four socioeconomic um, areas assessed right, right here in Fort Knox. So why did the G3 sign a finding of no significant impact? Uh, um, the SPA is governed by the National Environmental Policy Act, and at its heart, it's an environmental document. Um, and from an environmental perspective, it stands to reason that reducing soldiers will not have a harmful impact on, on the environment. And that is exactly what the finding of no significant impact really means. It says there's no significant environmental impact. That being said, the Army is well aware of significant socioeconomic impacts that additional reductions would have here at Fort Knox. In fact, it, it scored Fort Knox with a score of significant, which is the most severe score that you can get under the National Environmental Policy Act. So basically, the Army is well aware of the fact that socioeconomic impacts of additional cuts will be or have been scored as the most severe possible under, under the PEA. So I just wanted to let everybody know that's what, um, that's what the FONSI actually means. It doesn't mean that we don't recognize the significant socioeconomic impacts of additional cuts. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, no briefing from the Pentagon is going to be complete. Make sure it's not, you know, without a slide that sort of looks like this. Um, but don't worry, it's really not as bad as, as, as it looks. I'm going to talk through it. You'll notice in the upper left, you can see the Army's decision process 
gets input from a good number of sources. There's the Budget Control Act, there's the 2014 Quadrennial Defense Review, there's total Army analysis. So the Army doesn't start with a blank slate. We, we get very, very specific guidance. Next, as you kind of move along to the center, you can see that the environmental and socioeconomic impacts that we assessed in the PEA and then the SPEA, um, that's part of the process, part of the decision process. And then next, in the, in the upper right-hand corner, you'll notice that uh, information from today's session is one of the major inputs that will go into this process. The Army also considers the military value analysis scores and other factors such as national strategy readiness impacts. All this information is fed into a series of general officer steering committees at the one-star, two-star, three-star level, and the results are then presented to Army senior leadership. Ultimately, the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army make the final decisions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in closing, here's, here's a summary of the factors the Army considers in its process. As I mentioned, the military value analysis model assesses insulation factors that are important to brigade combat teams. It includes training assets, training land available, force projection capabilities, soldier well-being. Beyond the MVA, strategic considerations are central to the process. Uh, we need to ensure we have the right forces in the right locations uh, based on the threat the nation faces today and will face tomorrow. Cost and efficiencies, money is always important, but it's never more important than when you don't have money. So, I mean, money is, is always going to be a factor. Um, and then other factors include readiness. Soldiers got to be ready to meet real-world missions today, statutory requirements, and feasibility. Okay, next slide. So now that you have an idea of why we're here and what the Army is facing, I'd like to turn the session over to you, the Fort Knox community, to learn what information, what messages you want us to carry back to Army senior leaders as they make these very, very difficult decisions. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Colonel O'Donohue. And like his last slide said, it's, it's time for that most important point of tonight's meeting, and that's uh, input from this great community and uh, all of you here. Uh, let me provide an overview of the format, or if you will, or ground rules. Uh, first, to be clear, uh, it's just tremendous to have you all here. Again, thank you so much. Uh, this is not a town hall or a question and answer session, um, so that's, that's probably the most important thing to put up front. The forum is to provide an opportunity down at the, the microphone here, provide comments on factors you believe the Army leadership, as, uh, as Colonel O'Donohue just mentioned, can take back and consider before they make decisions about force reductions and restructuring that could affect our greater Fort Knox area. Uh, number two, those of us on stage uh, will simply yet carefully listen to those comments. And I repeat, again, it's, it's not a question and answer period, it's an opportunity uh, for these great leaders to listen and, uh, and, and respect your opinions and respect uh, the input that you're gonna provide. Uh, second, while the Army informed all 30 posts that the session is is to last up to two hours. And as the CG mentioned, we know there's a UK game coming on tonight, but uh, it, you heard Mr. McLaren say he would stay as long as it took. Um, it, your, your input is that important to him. So uh, we do, it, again, thank Hardin County Schools for being gracious enough to provide the, us a little extra time tonight. Our aim, simply put, is to allow as many people as possible uh, to provide comments at this event because we fully recognize uh, its importance. Third, those making comments, uh, we ask them to be concise. Uh, we ask uh, between two to five minutes each. Uh, this is to, again, ensure uh, key points don't uh, get buried and we don't impede the orderly flow of the session. Uh, fourth, we ask all comments to be informative and respectful. And uh, during our rehearsal for this, I, I continued on with the rules. And uh, someone in the audience mentioned, you know, we're all adults. We know what we're talking about. We're just asking for respect. Um, and and you, you know that when you see it. So uh, we, we, we ask for help. If, we have to, if I have to come up and give a warning, we'll do that. Um, we don't expect that at all. But uh, again, we understand that uh, our community has been, uh, as Colonel O'Donohue mentioned, has been significantly impacted with the loss of the BCT. And, and uh, a lot of you have some strong feelings. I, I've heard about them uh, quite a bit, and, uh, and we understand that. So again, uh, the listening session is for you to share your, your thoughts. Um, we have uh, 15 elected officials and civic leaders who have already scheduled to make comments tonight. Uh, 
uh, be that in person or via video. And as such, I will call those individuals up to the podium in front of the stage uh, by name and also will cue the videos up. As soon as they've completed their remarks, I will ask that others in attendance, uh, anyone in the, in the audience who wishes to make comments, please do so at, at the podium. Um, at that point, a line can form at the podium. We ask that line to be you know, no more than five or so just to keep it orderly um, and to keep people from having to stand up for an excess amount of time. Okay, now at this time I'd like to turn everyone's attention to our screen behind me, and we have a phenomenal uh, opportunity here. Uh, the, the governor of this great state of Kentucky has a message, Governor Steve Bashir. Good evening. Kentucky's fortunate to be the home of one of the finest military installations in the entire country, Fort Knox. The soldiers and their families are a special part of our Kentucky family, and we're proud of their service and grateful for their sacrifices. We welcome their strong values and offer the necessary support to help them thrive in our communities. The thousands of civilian employees that work in support of the missions at Fort Knox are also our family, and we're just as proud of them as they ensure that the Army can get the job done. Tonight, the Army will hear from a broad array of leaders and community members on their support for Fort Knox and the significant impact it has on Kentucky. We understand the Army is in a difficult position, but that they need to measure carefully as they consider the long-term impact of substantial cuts to Army installations. Fort Knox should not be considered for any more cuts, but instead be used to host functions the Army currently has in high-cost areas of the country. Using Fort Knox as a point of consolidation for multiple organizations is a smart and sound fiscal decision that will save taxpayer dollars. I encourage the Army to do everything they can to position units and functions in low-cost but highly efficient and capable installations like Fort Knox. Kentucky's recent major infrastructure investments near Fort Knox paved the way for the military's base realignment and closure initiative, leading to thousands of new jobs, thousands of new families, and hundreds of millions of new local payroll. This is in sharp contrast to many other states that did not have the foresight to make complementary investments outside the gates of growing installations. That infrastructure is primed and ready for a new wave of growth, and I encourage the Army to lead the way in taking advantage of all that Fort Knox and this region has to offer. We're confident that as the military looks for further cost-saving efficiencies, they'll see tremendous potential for Fort Knox to expand by consolidating all of the Army's human resource and recruiting-related functions there. The recent move of the Army's recruiting and retention school from Fort Jackson, South Carolina, to Fort Knox is a great first step. The Department of Defense should follow the Army's lead and move complementary joint missions to Fort Knox, building on what is emerging as a human capital center of excellence. Kentucky has absorbed far more cuts to its installations than other states, and these losses have real impact on our communities. We ask that thoughtful, strategic decisions be made, and the Army avoids implementing more cuts in Kentucky and instead recognizes that Fort Knox can and should grow. I thank the Army for taking time to listen to our citizens' concerns and support, and I especially thank the community members who over the years have been steadfast and loyal in their support of our Fort Knox soldiers and their families. Thank you. All right, thank you, Governor Bashir. I now ask the Governor's Executive Director for the Kentucky Commission on Military Affairs, Mr. Dave Thompson, to please come to the podium. And Dave, take it away, thank you. TJ, thank you very much, sir. Mr. McLaurin, Mr. Napoli, Major General Combs, Colonel Donahue, welcome to Kentucky. We thank you for the opportunity to provide comments about Fort Knox and force structure reductions here in the Commonwealth. As the Executive Director of the Kentucky Commission on Military Affairs and a recently retired Army officer myself, I have extensive experience in the Army. 
and at Fort Knox. In my final posting here, I commanded the 194th Armored Brigade, and I moved that unit from here to Fort Benning, Georgia, as mandated by the 2005 BRAC Commission. Today, I'm speaking as the governor's representative. Through our commission, I also represent the governor's cabinet secretaries and the leaders of the Veterans, Military Affairs, and Public Protection Committees of both the Kentucky House of Representatives and the Kentucky Senate. I will take just a few moments today to elaborate on some of the comments you just heard from our governor. I will refer to the chart here on my right. For the audience, the material will be displayed on the screen, and of course, you have copies in your folder. Next slide, please. I have three points to make tonight. The first, we must look at the current situation in the proper context. The next round of force structure cuts, if they occur, cannot be done in isolation of the previous cuts. There is a cumulative socioeconomic impact felt here in Kentucky as the Army makes sequential force structure cuts without congressional oversight and without revealing the results of analysis that led to the reductions. While perfectly legal, such methods weaken the trusting relationship built over many years by the Army and the regional community surrounding Fort Knox. The financial losses due to force structure reductions in the fiscal year 13-15 time period are substantial, as indicated on the slide. Sales volume and income loss due to Army decisions here in Kentucky alone amount to over three quarters of a billion dollars annually. Direct and indirect job loss is substantial, with 7,648 positions eliminated. All is the result of the reduction in 3-1, or the inactivation of the 3-1 Infantry Brigade Combat Team, and as well the recent announcement of the pending inactivation of the 159th Combat Aviation Brigade at Fort Campbell. The socioeconomic price paid to this point by the Commonwealth of Kentucky is so substantial that it bears special consideration by the Army and by the Department of Defense. Next slide. My second point. The Army must consider proportionality here. Much like how the Army prides itself on using proportionality on the battlefield, the same thinking must be applied here in the homeland. Kentucky has been disproportionately targeted for Army force structure cuts with over 30% of the last two years' cuts being made in this state. As you see on the chart, there's no other state that even compares. This would be easier to bear if the facts on the ground supported the decision to cut a brigade here, but they don't. Here's the fact. There is no better ground upon which to house and train an infantry brigade combat team or a striker brigade combat team anywhere in the eastern half of the United States than at Fort Knox, Kentucky. The disproportionate approach taken by the Army so far keeps fighting forces at places that are less able to train the units, and we know they are less ready. I urge the Army to do the right thing, restore proportionality to this process, so no single community or state is devastated economically, but most importantly, so your fighting forces can train where they live. Next slide, please. The third point and final point is really related to the second point I made with proportionality, is that the Army must communicate well, in my view, the strategic underpinnings of its decisions to cut force structure at specific installations. Taking 43% of the active component population from a single installation, as shown on the slide there, just doesn't make sense. In fact, it reverses BRAC 2005, Army and DOD approved recommendations. And I quote from the 2005 BRAC Commission, those recommendations dated May 2005, realign Fort Knox, Kentucky by relocating the Armor Center and School to Fort Benning, Georgia, to accommodate the activation of an infantry brigade combat team at Fort Knox. I go on to quote, this recommendation directly supports the Army's operational unit stationing and, stationing and training requirements by using available facilities, ranges, training land, and other resources available at Fort Knox, Kentucky." Unquote. The acknowledged high military value of Fort Knox must prevail over short-term budget constraints. 
I ask that the Army provide these communities more clarity about the future and provide them the information needed to understand their installation's strategic role in this increasingly complex world. I thank you again for allowing us to speak today and hearing what we have to say. The Army will find no better ally than the Commonwealth of Kentucky. If the question is, how can the Army save money while meeting its mission requirements around the globe? Grow Fort Knox is the answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. We now have another special video presentation, this time from Kentucky U.S. Senator Mitch McConnell. Hello, I'm Senator Mitch McConnell. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person today, but as you may know, the 114th Congress convenes today with a new majority leader who happens to be from Kentucky. I appreciate your giving me the opportunity to address the group through this video. Because the issue of protecting Fort Knox is so important, I wanted to reiterate to the administration and the community exactly where I stand. The world is too dangerous a place to make devastating cuts to our national defense. America faces a myriad of threats, from Afghanistan to ISIL to Ebola. These concerns make President Obama's proposed significant cuts to the active duty component of our military very unwise. The proposed cuts are not only harmful to our national security capabilities, they are alarming to me and to the Fort Knox community. Fort Knox has unique strengths that make it vital to our national defense, strengths that should be recognized by the Army in this process. As this community knows full well, Fort Knox is home to some 40,000 service members, Army civilians, and their families. This installation is critically important to the Army and our nation by virtue of its role as a hub for multiple major commands under the Training and Doctrine Command, or TRADOC. In addition to Cadet Command and Recruiting Command under TRADOC, the installation hosts the Army's Human Resources Command and numerous other active and reserve component commands. And for the first time this summer, the installation hosted thousands of cadets for extensive annual training under the Army's leaders' training courses. These cadets are in addition to the over 10,000 reserve component soldiers who receive training at Fort Knox uh, throughout the year. Now, as well as having exceptional training facilities, uh, Fort Knox offers tens of thousands of acres of excellent training grounds with additional room for growth. The installation has also successfully increased its energy efficiency and the cost of living at Fort Knox is well below the national average. These are important factors at a time when every dollar counts, both for the Army and for our soldiers' household budgets. The federal, state, and local governments have made significant investments both on and off post to support Fort Knox, its service members, and their families. The quality of life here for soldiers and their families is outstanding, and the installation has been consistently recognized in the Army's Communities of Excellence program. So I'll say it again. Our nation's armed forces are too important particularly at this critical juncture, for the administration to make these cuts. And simply put, Fort Knox is too important to our nation's military to bear the brunt of any force reduction. The administration has already cut the installation's lone brigade combat team, a decision I strongly oppose. We don't need any more cuts at Fort Knox. That's my position. I've made it clear to the president and this administration time and time again. I'm very appreciative of the community's tireless commitment to Fort Knox and its brave service members. Good luck with the rest of the community listening session. 
Thank you. Thank you, Senator McConnell. Now let's play a video, another video from the other Kentucky U.S. Senator, Rand Paul. Good evening, and thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts on the importance of Fort Knox, not only to the Army, but also to the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Throughout history, when the United States has been threatened by forces outside of our borders, it has been the men and women stationed at Army installations in Kentucky that have answered the call to sacrifice and defend this great nation. National defense is the primary constitutional function of the federal government and should remain this nation's top priority. The threats to this nation are ever-changing and emerging at a rapid pace. The administration should target non-defense Army spending before eliminating personnel needed to defend this nation. When Kentuckians are asked to sacrifice, they hope it is a benefit to the safety and security of this great nation. But in 2013, when the Obama administration decided to deactivate the brigade combat team from Fort Knox, it adversely affected not only the base, but also the surrounding communities. I believed then, and I believe now, that the decision was short-sighted, especially given the amount of support and investment the community, the Department of Defense employees, the service members, and their families have put into the Fort Knox community. I've called upon the Department of Defense to prioritize spending in order to supply the members of the armed forces with the tools they need. But part of prioritizing is looking at assets currently held and using them more efficiently. I understand that the Army is facing budget reductions, and I'm very supportive of the elimination of duplicative and unnecessary programs. But I do not consider service members and their families as duplicative or unnecessary. Taking advantage of the investments to infrastructure, both on the base and in the surrounding communities, is using assets efficiently to reduce costs. With over 80,000 acres of usable training resources and central location, Fort Knox has made an exceptional home for the Army's Human Resources Command, multiple commands under the Training and Doctrine Command, and recently the location of the Leadership Development and Assessment course required by all ROTC cadets, the future leaders of the Army. For the continued strength of the United States, we must maintain a strong national defense. Addressing frivolous spending and prioritizing projects will go a long way in providing for our service members and the communities that support them. Thank you all for this opportunity to speak on behalf of Fort Knox. May God bless you and bless this great nation. Thank you, Senator Paul. Now I'd like to introduce the core committee executive director and retired Major General Bill Barron. General Barron. Good evening, uh, General Combs and Colonel Edwards. Uh, I too would like to welcome Mr. McLaurin and his team from Washington. Thanks to each of you for your service to our Army and uh, uh, for joining us this evening for this important event. Next chart. The core committee founded in 1991 is a local organization chartered to protect, promote, and grow Fort Knox and to support local soldiers and their families. The membership consists of some 30 elected officials, local business leaders, and retired senior Army veterans who want the best for the Army, for Fort Knox, and for our soldiers. My intent today is to highlight why Fort Knox should be the DOD and the Army's installation of choice for the future. Next chart. Fort Knox has undergone a significant transformation since the 2000 round of BRAC real, base realignment and closure. A major loss, of course, was the armor school moving to Fort Benning, but that loss was offset by the gains that you see on this chart. With seven new general officer commands on the installation, representing both the active and reserve component, daily life on Fort Knox was certainly high adventure, to say the least, with all sorts of new local and regional challenges to take into consideration. Next chart. I'm proud to say that the Commonwealth of Kentucky rode to the sound of the guns when called upon to support the needs of the Army. 
The state invested some $250 million for transportation and infrastructure improvements, while local communities invested some $50 million in Kentucky economic development bonds. A huge surge in construction of single and multifamily housing units began almost immediately to offset the small number of family housing units available on post, all done at a time when money was in short supply. Next chart. Life was good. Every day was filled with talk on the streets of economic growth and much good news, at least until the tables began to turn. The first significant blow to the community was when U.S. Army Accessions Command cased its colors in January of 2012, and we soon learned that the 3-1 Infantry Brigade Combat Team would stand down in May of 24, or May 2014, which resulted in a loss of some 3,600 permanent party personnel plus their families. Today, our communities continue to feel the pain as the Army continues its drawdown. Next chart. The projections on this chart come from a recent study done by local real estate analyst Rick Baumgardner and takes into account the ultimate impact of the combined 7,600 cuts outlined in the PEA and SPEA together, if allowed, to happen at Fort Knox. Clearly, more cuts after the loss of 3-1 will have a devastating effect on the Commonwealth and the local communities. Next chart. Let's talk now about why Fort Knox should be exempt from additional cuts. First, we have clearly taken more than our fair share of cuts compared to other Army installations. Second, let me outline why Fort Knox is the best choice, the right choice, for the Department of Defense, the Department of the Army, and equally as important, the taxpayer. Next chart. Fort Knox is real estate, and real estate is all about location. The bullets on this slide clearly outline Fort Knox's advantages from its central location within the U.S. In particular, reasonable air fares from and to any point in the U.S. Next chart. From my view as a career-long Army trainer, there are no better ranges and facilities in the Army than what you have right here at Fort Knox. Knox has a proven track record of supporting AC, RC, joint and civilian training over many, many years. 92% of Fort Knox, or 101,000 acres, is either ranges or training areas. Fort Knox has 87,857 certified maneuver acres, which satisfactorily supported the Army's largest separate armor brigade, the 194th, for over 27 years, and most recently accommodated the 3-1 Light Infantry Brigade Combat Team. Next chart. Specifics on Fort Knox's ranges are on this slide. Not on this slide, but equally important is the Zussman Urban Combat Training Center, which was certified in 2011 as a combined arms collective training facility and has been recently expanded to accommodate unmanned aerial systems. Next chart. One of the best testimonials for our ranges here at Fort Knox comes directly from Colonel Bill Oslin, the last commander of the 3-1 Duke Brigade before they cased their colors here. The very first sentence says it all. Fort Knox, Kentucky has the best ranges and range control east of the Mississippi. Other comments address the availability of ranges when needed and low TDY cost to Fort Bragg and Fort Benning for other training requirements. Next chart. Godman Airfield is fully instrumented with three operational runways that are C-130 capable, and Godman is the home of the United States Army Reserve Aviation, in addition to supporting many transient flights from the 101st Airborne Division, Special Operations Community, the Kentucky-Tennessee National Guard, and Mill Air or JOSOC missions. The USAR, USAR 11th Aviation Command currently has 33 UH-60 UH rotary wing and four C-12 fixed wing aircraft on site. Next chart. The Kentucky Congressional Delegation has always had a keen interest in Fort Knox and the well-being of its soldiers and families. At the forefront of this interest is the, replace of the replacement of one, if not the oldest hospitals in the Army inventory, Ireland Army Hospital, with a new modern ambulatory clinic, which I might add, has, which I might add has been funded by Congress in the amount of $145 million. This proposed facility is of the utmost importance 
in providing modern quality care for the thousands of ROTC cadets each year that will get their first and second looks at Army life during LTC or LDAC, as well as the thousands of reserve component students, other healthcare eligibles working on Fort Knox, and for the new units and soldiers who will surely relocate here in the future. Next chart. The vacancy sign is on at Fort Knox. We have room to grow, there's no question. After making a $250 million investment of taxpayer money for new brick and mortar, state-of-the-art facilities for the now departed 3-1 IBCT, Fort Knox has some prime real estate available totaling some 743,000 square feet that you can see broken out by function on this chart. Next chart. Fort Knox is fortunate to have a superb U.S. Army Garrison Command Team that delivers flexible, innovative, and relevant programs and services that enable readiness and resiliency across the total military family here at Fort Knox. Next chart. Net zero energy, waste, and water is the coin of the realm for the future, and Fort Knox is leading the way for the Army. Fort Knox is only weeks away, March to be exact, from being able to operate completely off of the energy grid if and when required. <laughs> Overall energy consumption at Fort Knox has been reduced by 50% since 2003. Next chart. Fort Knox is also near the top 25 of all U.S. cities for its number of certified Energy Star rated facilities. The Elizabethtown, Kentucky metro area, which includes Fort Knox, was ranked one, number one by the Department of Energy as a top Energy Star small city in 2014 with 53 certified buildings. 50 of those buildings are located on Fort Knox and provide <laughs> Those 50 buildings provide an annual cost savings of almost $2 million per year. Current solar panel ground and roof arrays produce over 4 megawatts of electrical power. 6 million square feet of building space on Fort Knox uses geothermal HVAC, cutting utility bills by 50% each month. Next chart. Opportunities for expanding the mission set at Fort Knox are endless and would take many more slides than I'm allotted today. In addition to the earlier attributes I have listed, the fact that Fort Knox is one of the lowest BAH areas in the United States and falls into the rest of the U.S. locality pay region for civilian pay provides Fort Knox significant strength to support DOD and service functions at reduced cost over other installations. Next chart. Fort Knox has been producing well-trained soldiers and our leaders for our nation for almost a century, and it stands poised to lead the way for DOD and the Army in the years to come. To be sure, strength does in fact start here. My next and last slide. As we like to say in the Commonwealth of Kentucky, the home of fast horses, Fort Knox and the local communities are all about unbridled potential, and we stand ready to make that commitment to the Department of Defense and the Army for the future. Thank you. Thank you, General Barron. Now we will hear from Kentucky's 2nd District U.S. Congressman Brett Guthrie. And although he's not physically here, we're told he's watching this session in Washington, D.C. right now via the, our live stream, and we know there's several out there watching. Uh, so with that said, now to the video of Congressman Guthrie. Good evening. I'm Brett Guthrie, your representative right here in Kentucky, 2nd District. I'm sorry I can't be with you this evening, as today is the first day of the new 114th Congress, and I'm in Washington today. A very busy year is about to kick off, but I wanted you to know that I will be closely monitoring these community listening sessions to make sure our local community has a strong voice during discussions about the future of the military. I'm thankful that the 2nd District is home to Fort Knox, such a valuable asset to the military and to the entire region. 
Knox also holds a special value to me personally as I trained here as a young cadet in the Army. I know that Fort Knox has a tremendous impact on your daily lives as soldiers, families, employers, and citizens. Because of the important role that Fort Knox plays in this region, I continue to work hard to make sure it remains a premier institution for our servicemen and women, both through engagement in Washington, D.C., where I've met personally with then Vice Chief of Staff General Campbell to tout the importance of Fort Knox, and in Kentucky, where I led a tour of the facility with Congressman Mac Thornberry, who is the new Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. During our tour, Chairman Thornberry was able to see Fort Knox's crucial capabilities, including world-class training facilities, access to nearly all modes of transportation, and, e and even energy security capabilities. Given the Chairman's high-profile position in the new Congress, I know his visit to Fort Knox will continue to serve Kentucky well. I hope today's community listening session proves valuable for all parties and that the Army decision makers see the tremendous value that Fort Knox adds in terms of mission readiness and community support. The community surrounding Fort Knox includes a lot of talented folks that have the Army and our soldiers' best interests at heart, many of whom you will hear from today. The decision makers in the Pentagon would do well to listen to their advice. The Fort Knox community has already suffered substantial losses as a result of the President's Defense Planning Guidance of 2012. I look forward to continuing to fight any further cuts for Fort Knox and welcome the community listening session as an important opportunity to let our voices be heard. Thank you, Congressman Guthrie. At this time, I'd like to welcome Louisville's Mayor Greg Fisher to the podium. Mayor Fisher. Uh, well, good evening to everybody, and thanks for the opportunity to present on behalf of Louisville today. We're proud to be part of the uh, Hardin County and Fort Knox regional economy. And my job here today is to uh, talk about Louisville and what we're doing to support Fort Knox and how we're just proud to be part of the team. Uh, one of our goals in Louisville is to be seen as a super supportive, veteran friendly community. Uh, I believe you guys know Louisville is about 45 minutes from here, so we're just part of the general area here. And how we rally our support in Louisville is in a bunch of different ways, but one is through something we call uh, VCAL, which is the Veterans Community Alliance of Louisville. That's our umbrella organization that we created with about 24 different individual organizations that provide some type of veteran or active military support. And as you all know, it is often hard to navigate through these support services. So this is our central function in Louisville to make that easy. Uh, we've created an integrated network of support for veterans and families, so it's just easier to access resources and communicate across organizational lines, and most importantly, to show our veterans that we appreciate their service and that they know that Louisville is an easy place to live where they're appreciated. Now, a big part of this, as you all know, is that transition from military to civilian life. This is a time that's fraught with a lot of uncertainty on what it's going to look like once you uh, become a civilian once again. We view, we view the most important aspect of that as finding a good job. So our administration was a leader in the creation of something called Opportunity Knox, uh, which is a program that makes our, regions, uh, makes our region a veteran talent magnet in connecting veteran jobs and the community, and has a great complement, of course, with the Human Resource Command and all the focus on human capital here in Fort Knox. So our goal is to add 10,000 more veterans to the region's workforce by 2017. Uh, we feel like we've made the boldest commitment in the country to that type of veteran transition and placement into the workforce. Uh, we've been, we spent about two years developing Opportunity Knox. We launched it in September. We have 94 participating em employers so far, and we'll be reporting our first numbers later this month and we're well on our way to our first year goal, which is connecting 25 veterans with good jobs in our regional economy. We're also part of a national movement to end veterans homelessness in our community uh, by the end of this year. Uh, we started this project last year. We'll formally announce our plans and funding to house the 360 homeless veterans that are in the Louisville area later this month. This is a very doable number. We can name and claim each one of these folks and get them into good, supportive housing. Also, there's a lot of uh, veterans, as we all know, that need more help. 
uh, rather than just a home. So we've done a lot to address long-term issues like PTSD, addiction, and other health issues. We've created a Veterans Treatment Court, which operates within the drug court program here in Kentucky, uh, serving 115 counties, and we've earned a reputation for reducing recidivism and returning participants to productive lives. The other aspect that we're proud of in Louisville is taking every opportunity possible to celebrate both active duty military and veterans. Uh, we relaunched our Louisville Veterans Day Parade in 2011. Uh, I, we've been told that had, we hadn't had a Veterans Day Parade since World War II, which is kind of hard to believe. But we launched that and we've been going strong for four years. And this just past year, we introduced what we called a Week of Valor. This was a further effort to put focus on veterans and active military with the intent to educate citizens about the issues facing both active duty and veterans and to inform veterans about the programs and solutions for transition into civilian life and thank them at every possible turn for their service. So that's the veteran uh, and active duty type focus of Louisville's uh, presentation. Now let's talk a little bit about the advantages of this geographic area and why it makes sense uh, for the Pentagon to make a decision to grow our forces here. Uh, the Pentagon certainly, uh, when you all look at your decision, so much of it is geographic based and cost based. I'm a business guy that just happens to be mayor, so I do that at the same way. Uh, UPS's world port is located here in Louisville, so we can ship anything around the world. Uh, next day, the Ohio River is the, our original interstate system. Uh, our interstate system of roads with interstates, three major interstates coming through this region, and puts it is, a, is logical because of our geographic location right here in the heart of North America, where two thirds of the U.S. population can drive to Fort Knox in one day. That is a, a unique asset we have. Also, this region around Fort Knox in Hardin County, uh, our, this 22 county region is the state's greatest concentration of business and industry activity by far. Our economic development clusters in this region where we're either best in the world or on our way to being best in the world include advanced manufacturing, uh, world-class health care, e-commerce and logistics, business ser services, and food and beverage. And so we base our economic development focus around those. In uh, with Louisville, uh, we have all the five major arts groups when the veterans decide to locate here. Uh, we have a broad array of culture and arts and food, lover activity going on here at the same time with lots of community involvement and as opposed to some of the bigger cities in the country, manageable traffic and has been talked about here before, a very reasonable cost of living. I think our most important asset, to be honest with you, is just friendly people. Uh, when people move here... <laughs> And at the end of the day, we as American citizens want to be happy. And I know uh, that's part of the Army's mission as well. So making sure we grow both your all's presence here in terms of active uh, duty and veterans, uh, we'll have a lot more happy Americans. That's always a good decision. So thank you all for this opportunity. Mayor Fisher, thank you so much. Now let me introduce the mayor of Radcliffe, Mr. Mike Weaver. Mr. McLaren, I'm uh, addressing my comments to you tonight because about an hour and a half ago you told me that you have come here to listen and you're going to take what we have to say back and hopefully do something about it. Now I'm what the chief of staff of the Army calls a soldier for life. I also understand, after talking to you as a retired colonel, you fit in the same category. I want you to know that in this audience tonight, there are a whole lot of other soldiers for life. Now, slide one. Before I retired from the Army, I came and went from this community during the last 14 years of my 34-year Army career. For the last 22, Ratcliffe has been my home. For 10 years, I've represented this community in the state legislature. And for the past four, I have served as the chairman 
of the Fort Knox Retiree Council. And now, at age 76, I'm celebrating my third day <laughs> as the mayor of Radcliffe. <clears throat> And sir, I am a live witness to the partnership with Fort Knox. And it is very, very painful to see what has happened here. BRAC 2005 took the Armor School in the center, and along with that went Patton Museum. Reduced to almost nothing. It's a great tourist attraction for this area, and we're trying to build it back but we're trying to do it back with very little money. And as a 16-year member of the Pat Museum Foundation and the current vice chair, that was also very painful. New life came to us with the sessions and human resources commands, along with a voice that said, build and they were come. That's what we were told. We built, they came, and then they left. Slide two. Why did this happen to Fort Knox? To get a better understanding, I asked for some help from some old friends, some old Army acquaintances. They're former Armor and Field Artillery officers who still work as operations research and system analysis consultants for the Army. And with their help, we evaluated a DA database called Forces. And we understand that 33 services, all common to every camp, post, and station, are fed into this database. What came out of the other end of it for Fort Knox is shocking, painful, disappointing, and unbelievable. We have a few sample questions about what is fed into the database. For example, what value was placed on environmental impact? There are no environmental restrictions impacting training at Fort Knox now. Was that evaluation done properly? We know that there were and still are serious environmental restrictions and lingering problems at other posts where the cost to station the soldier is much less than at Fort Knox. We did have a bat problem here at one time, but I'm happy to tell you that our bats are safe and happy in our training areas now. <laughs> Another question is, was the security of our nation's gold depository even considered when the decision was made to remove combat troops from Fort Knox? It would seem to me and to a lot of people who live in this area that a contingency force made up of combat troops close to the gold vault would have been a real good idea. And finally, according to the database, the annual cost to station a soldier at Fort Knox is $4,357, while the cost for Fort Benning is $3,555. Jackson, $2,875. Leonard Wood, 2,839, Eustace, 2017, and Fort Hood, 1,752. And then there's Fort Sam Houston, which comes in at $989. Governor Bashir talked about the low cost of living in Kentucky. Senator McConnell talked about the same thing. And Mayor Greg Fisher talked about the same thing. The low cost of living in Kentucky is a fact. So to most of us here tonight, this comparison of cost just does not make sense. Could it have been that the data fed into the base should be reevaluated? Should there be an audit? Should there be an audit to determine if all post, camps, and stations are feeding the database by the same standard 
and is their data current? Slide three. Could it be that Fort Knox is being penalized for having world-class ranges? Penalized for having a first-class warrior transition facility? Penalized for modern administration buildings, barracks, and dining facilities? Penalized for having an energy-efficient solar array? Having its own water plant? Having the largest and most modern office complex in Kentucky that now houses Human Resources Command? and possibly being penalized for all of the other sunk costs that have made Fort Knox what it was, what it is, and what it can be. We ask you to please take another look. Now, Fort Knox is a first-class training facility that provided prime maneuver space over 87,000 acres for the 194th Armor Brigade during my time here. And it has provided the same to every deployable unit that has served here since. We understand that the peak strength of 570,000 is no more. We understand that final end strength could be somewhere between 480 and 490, 440, 450. And you just told us that it might even go as low as 420. I would agree, and the people in Radcliffe would agree, that that is dangerous. So we probably have to accept the fact that active duty maneuver forces are gone from here for right now. We also sincerely hope that sometime in the not too distant future that some sense will come of the defense of this country and we'll build that back up. <laughs> but in the meantime, prime training areas remain here. And they remain here at a cost to the whole nation. But they've been paid for. And they should be used. So in the interim, I would like for you to go back and take a look at the reserve component. Could Fort Knox maybe become a training center of excellence for the reserve component? We understand from the data we've collected that three reserve component soldiers equals one active duty soldier for the purposes of economic impact. Would you please have someone take another look at the validity of the input data that goes into the DA database called forces? Data that has produced the kind of output that we've just talked about. This historic post should not become an office park. Mr. McLaren, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mayor, Ma Mayor Weaver. Now, District 10 State Senator Dennis Parrott, as well as 18th District State Representative Tim Moore, who happens to still be a serving Air Force Colonel in the Reserves, will address how the state legislature has supported Fort Knox, the military in general, and veterans. And gentlemen, I understand today was your first day back at work too, so thanks for uh, making the road trip back here. We appreciate it. Cool. Thank you. <clears throat> Colonel Evers, we do apologize for being just a little bit late. It was our first day. We also got out later than we thought we would. But General Combs, your aviation unit commander, would be very proud of how fast we got here from Frankfurt in a car. So, <laughs> and I was driving. Our goal tonight is, is to show you the true commitment of both the Commonwealth of Kentucky and the Kentucky General Assembly to our, to our military presence in Kentucky. And we think you'll see some of the projects we've done and some of the ways we've done that. Just in the past few years, there's been over 120 pieces of legislation in the Kentucky General Assembly that affected our military personnel. Now, some of them affected our military personnel, our veterans directly, but the other ones indirectly. And if you look at the large volume of bills that we handle or that we see, that is a very high percentage. So there is a strong military commitment from our General Assembly and our state government. Well, Major General Combs and Ms. McLaren, I also want to echo our appreciation for you coming and listening tonight with your whole team. 
and to repeat again the emphasis that the support for Fort Knox and for the Army and the military in general goes far beyond just the two of us. There are a whole host of legislators who have served past, present, and even brand new uh, who have been supportive and will continue to be supportive of the military. You know, recently we celebrated the 200 year anniversary of the War of 1812, and it was pointed out that over half of the folks who served in that particular war and were injured or, or killed came from Kentucky. Kentucky has a long standing reputation of stepping forward to support the military and the defense of this nation. One of the things you've already heard mentioned and we want to highlight once again is the fact that when others saw a challenge with the BRAC changes that came down just a few years ago, Kentucky stepped up and recognized the opportunity that it presented. And so the legislature, the governor, and again, legislators far beyond even Hardin County recognized that this was such an important opportunity that we committed and invested $251 million toward infrastructure and other transitional costs that would be incurred because of the influx and even the outflux of personnel at Fort Knox. We were committed and remain so today. That $250 million mostly went to major new roads that helped the traffic flow and the influx around and in and around the post. And, and some of those new roads are just now uh, being opened, Pat Patriot Parkway being one of them. Uh, so a lot of the money went to roads, but a lot of other projects uh, into our schools. But I have a list here for some of the other projects aimed at our military personnel, but it also infected, affected all the, the citizens in this entire area. I know some county judges, uh, executives from other counties, and I'm just gonna read a few of them that this, this money also went to, not just the roads, but a lot of water and sewer and infrastructure projects. For example, the city of Muldraw, a wastewater collection rehab. Hardin County Water District number two, a sewer collection system project. The city of Radcliffe, a wastewater pump station upgrade. Uh, Louisville Water Company, Fort Knox Hardin County Regional Transmission Line. Uh, city of Brandenburg, water treatment plant upgrade. The Shepherdsville South Bullet Interceptor. Vine Grove sewer line extension. So this money uh, really went to a long way to go in our infrastructure in this area. One of the things that we want to emphasize in our presentation, obviously Fort Knox brings much to our community. Not the least of which is a lot of the folks sitting in this room who came here to Kentucky because they were a part of the Fort Knox family at one time and continue to be part of our local community family. But in addition to these infrastructure projects that invested in the people who would live and work on or near Fort Knox, supporting the mission there, something that Kentucky has also done is make sure that we provide incentive and encouragement to those military members individually and their families. For example, in 2009, Kentucky exempted military pay from Kentucky income tax. And we did not... <laughs> we did not perceive that as a net cost or loss. What we perceive that as is an investment in convincing folks who just might happen to be stationed here for a season that this is a place to put down roots, to begin to establish a home, and indeed, as I said, many of the folks in this room have done just that even before we established the income tax exemption and beyond even the people who were stationed at Fort Knox, we have a number of veterans who came here to Kentucky and more specifically to the Fort Knox region because they had heard and they have learned by experience that this indeed is a wonderful place to live and to raise a family because of the support that this community has offered and again continues to offer to our military community. Uh, as mentioned, there's been uh, numerous bills. We've already talked about that, but one of the ones I do want to talk about is the next slide. Thank you. The Yellow Ribbon Tuition Assistance Partner State. Kentucky is a partner state in that. This is where our post-secondary uh, institutions in Kentucky offer tuition credits uh, to our veterans, and most of those are very, very proud of that. They have veterans coordinators to do that in those institutions, and, and uh, it's been a wonderful thing, and they very actively recruit our veterans into that tuition assistance program. You know, the other thing that we want to emphasize, even as we reiterate the numerous bills, many of these bills were initiated at the request of the Army and the military as they recognized needs or perhaps shortcomings that needed to be addressed regarding the soldiers 
and other military members and their families. So the second bullet, even on this slide, talks about the civilian military workers and their families, and obviously we have a number of them now here at Fort Knox working, that we as the state of Kentucky, Commonwealth, has extended the same educational benefits as we provide to servicemen and women and their families. Again, addressing an identified need to make sure that we continually support the ongoing mission here at Fort Knox. The other thing that we want to emphasize is, beyond even the po folks who are currently at Fort Knox and working, is the employment opportunities for separating soldiers. This again is something that the Army itself identified because it recognizes that not only does it need to make sure that it provides for its soldiers while they are on duty, but it needs to be the partner with them long beyond even their military service career because we want to provide opportunities for these soldiers to continue to be productive members of our society and obviously of our community. Kentucky has stepped up to the plate in that regard. Representative Moore stated, we're very proud of this next part, and that is the employment, go back to the one, please. This part about our separating soldiers. In Kentucky, our boards, when they license our contractors, whether it be HVAC, medical technicians, firefighters, you can see there, they are given credit for some of the expertise and the training they had in their branch of service. And a lot of times we have to be certified to get into these fields. That goes a long way to the certification. Many times their experience will give them the cert certification. They go right into that field, go right to work. You know, we all know that when our soldiers get out of the military, we know what kind of work ethic they have. And our employers recognize that, and that is why we have that in place in Kentucky, and we're very, very proud of that. Ironically, the last bullet on here could have been uh, Senator Parrott with his experience with agriculture, but we do have a proud tradition of agriculture, not just in the central part of Kentucky, but all around our Commonwealth. And so we are a national leader in providing opportunities and highlighting the skills of our soldiers who are now separated or retired. And within our own Kentucky Department of Agriculture, we created a Homegrown by Heroes branding so that soldiers and veterans who become farmers can market their produce. And as Senator Parrott and I were talking on the way over here, it is a smash hit at the uh, local farm bureaus and other places where there's farm produce being sold. And here, even in Hardin County, we have that. And so our veterans are finding opportunities all across the spectrum. And again, this goes to the point that not only are we stepping up ahead of the game, but we're also continuing to partner with these soldiers long after their military career has ended or they move on to another stage of life. My last part is the talk about our Kentucky uh, Veterans Cemetery Central. Uh, we have a very large uh, military cemetery in Hardin County, just out, just south of uh, Radcliffe, uh, north of Radcliffe, south of Fort Knox. It is one of the newest in Kentucky but it's also the largest already, it has most interments in any cemetery uh, of all of our military and veterans uh, cemeteries in Kentucky. We're very, very proud of that. Uh, Chuck Heater, they do a tre tremendous job up there. And my father is buried there, and I'm telling you, it is a very dignified and beautiful place, and we are very, very, very lucky to have it. We will close our comments with another success story that is under construction as we speak the Central Kentucky Veterans Nursing Home in Radcliffe that was leveraged into reality by state funding support. And the reason this is so important to highlight is other states were given the opportunity to step forward and meet some of the requirements that the VA and the military had put into place. But Kentucky leapfrogged ahead of others to be able to move forward on construction of this VA nursing home, or excuse me, the Veterans Nursing Home, and it partnered once again with Fort Knox, who provided some of the land that will be utilized for this facility. And it shows one more time the commitment that Kentucky has demonstrated time and again to not only supporting our post, not only supporting our military, I can tell you I've landed countless times in Godman Army Airfield as joint training with the Army right here, but we continue to partner for the life of the veterans that are in our community. And these veterans out here would tell you each and every one that Fort Knox means something to them specially, but that this community that extends both on and off post is one of the secrets to why this is the place to live and where all of them call home. 
and I hope you'll come back and visit our home anytime. Thank you, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. And I, I do want to say you talked about speeding. We have some of Radcliffe's finest in the back uh, there. And I saw the new sheriff of Hardin County, John Ward, over there writing your, your names down. So <laughs> you, you might want to be more careful driving, but uh, we do appreciate you being here. Right on. Well, we, we gave a shout out to the University of Kentucky, and uh, we, we know we have some fans out there. For, but to be equal, uh, we have a great friend in Dr. James Ramsey, who is up at the University of Louisville. And he's made a video, and we'd like to share that with you right now. I'm Jim Ramsey, president of the University of Louisville. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person for this important community conversation about the future of Fort Knox. I have great respect for the history and tradition of Fort Knox and the vital role it has played in our state and nation. In fact, July 22, 1970, I began my basic training at Fort Knox. Fort Knox is a much different, much better place today than then and the University of Louisville couldn't be more proud of the relationship we have with this country's greatest and arguably most well-known military base. We've recognized some time ago that Fort Knox was more than just an economic driver for Hardin, Meade, and Bullock counties. We saw the brain power and leadership skills of the soldiers and families at Fort Knox as a key to the economy of our region and state. And the leadership at Fort Knox recognized that they had a premier metropolitan research university just a few miles north in Louisville, a research university that could provide training and a college education to soldiers, as well as research in areas like PTSD and combat injuries. So we've got a tremendous collaboration that was formalized by this memorandum of understanding between Fort Knox and the University of Louisville. It was signed by the senior commanding general and me in 2011 detailing 10 areas of cooperation and expansion of existing programs, including research in traumatic brain injury and PTSD, fitness programs for soldiers, and family financial counseling, expansion of leadership and training programs in human resources, engineering, and business, expansion of UofL course offerings at Fort Knox, and participation in sustainability initiative to reduce energy use and cost. But these are just a few of the ways Fort Knox and UofL are focusing on soldiers, their families, and our communities. Exercise physiologists from our College of Education are working with wounded warriors to return them to their fighting level of fitness. Our College of Social Work is using a $480,000 grant to give Fort Knox families free behavioral health counseling. We have full scholarships for military spouses pursuing advanced degrees and a unique program called Vet Start, where we help entrepreneurial veterans start their own businesses. Scholarships for students graduating from Fort Knox High School. Our students, faculty, and staff have learned a lot in collaborating with Fort Knox leaders, soldiers, and their families. We've also benefited from physical training and team building exercises. Our student athletes have been put through the paces on Fort Knox training courses. We believe you would be hard pressed to find another major university in Army Post with a better relationship and more collaborative agreements. The faculty, staff, and students at the University of Louisville understand the importance of Fort Knox and its value to our university, our region, and our state. We hope the Army, officials in Washington, and others understand the unique relationship and programs that we have with Fort Knox, benefiting hundreds of soldiers and their families. Again, I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person, but I wanted to let you know that UofL stands ready to support, advocate, and help in any way we can to keep Fort Knox a strong, vibrant part of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. While on the topic of education, I'd like to now welcome Hardin County School Superintendent Nanette Johnston to the podium. Ms. Johnston. So now let's talk a little bit about my passion, which is children and families. Um, first of all, if you're a parent here tonight, would you raise your hand? All right. And as parents, 
I think the most important thing we strive to do is provide a nice warm home for our children, love, care, nurturing, but we want to provide them the experiences and opportunities that they need in order to ensure their success. Well, I can say with assurance as a parent of two adult children that we're, my husband and I are proud that we succeeded in that mission. But I can also stand here and say, as a proud educator of what I call my 14,700 students, that Hardin County Schools succeeds in that mission as well. We offer... I can tell you that because I have been with this district for 32 years and I've been educated by this district for 13 years and I'm a graduate of this uh, school district. We offer families, we offer our soldiers and their families what they yearn for, quality. Quality facilities, quality opportunities, and love and care and understanding. We are sitting here tonight in the Performing Arts Center. This is just one example of the priority that the taxpayers you see in front of you have placed in value for what they offer their children. Quality. Quality resources, quality facilities. But quality in the facilities is only the beginning. We pride ourselves in offering authentic experiences this Performing Arts Center offers our children opportunities to have real-life experiences with professionals, with professional actors. This community has made sure that our competitive bands have opportunities to perform in locations such as Carnegie Hall and being invited to, to march in the Macy's Day Parade in two, two, 2015. We're most proud, as you can look at the first slide here, in our new Early College and Career Center that offers many of the pathways you see there. Some of the pathways we offer here in this district are not offered anywhere else in the state of Kentucky. And I can attest that our students are number one phlebotomy students because I've got proof on both arms. <laughs> Not a bruised one, so I would put them out there to work with Dennis Johnson and Hardin Memorial Hospital at any time. We're very proud of our newest addition. We're proud because we built that facility in partnership with Western Kentucky University with the intention of building it on a college campus so that we can provide our children in this community with college level credit at a lower reduced cost. Our goal is to provide an associate degree opportunity for our students upon graduation from high school. We're at about 40 hours of college credit at this time. We are also very proud of the fact that our students earn industry level certificates. This center has been open since August of this school year. And to date, in the first four months, we've had over 88 students that have already earned industry-level certificate and go out to the world of work today and earn a higher-paying job in EKG tech, in a medical nurse assistant, in um, ASC certification, and many others. We are pr proud of the results that we have and proud of what we can offer all children that come into this community. Our high schools are ranked among the top in the state. In fact, two of our high schools rank in the 96th percentile. We offer unique programs in this very school. This high school offers a hydroponics agricultural program. Each of our schools offers engineering programs and all of our middle and high school programs offer robotics. In fact, our robotics, our robotics program is ranked third in the world Yes, third is Cecilia, Kentucky. The World Robotics Championship will be held this year in Louisville, Kentucky, and we attribute that to our championship team right here in Hardin County Schools. Why would we not want to offer all children with this experience? We also offer much more than a high-quality education. 
we teach our children how to be good citizens and leaders. We offer a work ethic certification program in partnership with our Hardin County Chamber of Commerce. Now it offers unique college credit in partnership with Western Kentucky University. We also offer JROTC programs at all three high schools, which are now at capacity. We also, <laughs> we're very proud to be in partnership with the United States Army in the first of its kind junior leadership program that is offered at our middle school. Now Hardin County Schools is the sole funder of that program. As you can see in the second bullet, our community has stepped up. Our taxpayers have stepped up to improve our facilities, to build new facilities. In addition, we have organized some of our schools at the end uh, of the county closest to Fort Knox to reduce the number of transitions that our families have to make by restructuring our grade configuration. Our administrators and teachers have gone through extensive training with Fort Knox to help them prepare to deal with the emotional and social needs of our families uh, in, in a highly deployed area that we were not used to dealing with. We, did, we had extra training in order to um, be able to, to serve our students. We've initiated programs such as student to student programs. We participate in programs very closely and work with our military family life consultants, again, to take care of our children, our social and emotional needs that they may have. Next slide. Also within this uh, partnership, we pride ourselves on making sure we meet the transition needs of those students moving into our county to make sure the credits that they've received in other school districts count toward their credit here in our school district. I serve on a, um, a committee on a program called the Military um, uh, excuse me, the first inter interstate compact for educational opportunities for military children to ensure that as children transfer credits that they get all of the credits that they've worked so hard to deserve in order to ease that transition. We are very proud of the partnerships that we have in this community. In fact, this community is a prime example of our early college and career center, which was a result of a community field trip, seeing the need that was uh, for, for the opportunities for our students here in this community. We partnered with the Chamber of Commerce for the Work Ethics Certification Program. As a community several years ago, I was very proud to travel to many different communities with the BRAC Roadshow so that they could see the opportunities that they would have by coming to our community. We've built roads, we've built schools, we've remodeled schools, we've restructured schools in order to take care of everyone that moves into our community. And tonight's listening session, I think in itself, is a grand example of how this community pulls together in order to take care of their people. So what do we need? We need stability. We have built, we've remodeled, we have renovated, we have used community taxpayer dollars, but we've invested love, time, and care in making sure that all the people that move into this community are taken care of. We have done that as a community. We've done that as a school district like none other. We've stepped up we will continue to step up. We have proven that we have the quality. Now we need the stability. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nanette. At this time, I'd like to welcome Hardin County Chamber of Commerce President and CEO, Brad Richardson to the podium. Brad. Thank you, Colonel. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. General Combs, gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure of talking about a few more community support initiatives. You've heard about a number of them 
uh, in the past hour. Uh, I'm going to talk about four, first slide please, uh, four specific, first land usage, and this has to do with the uh, installation and we don't encroach. Uh, we follow the best practices of ACUB, the Army, the Army Compatible Use Buffer Zone, to ensure that our military partners have unencumbered ranges and training areas. We understand our land use practices must be supportive. We have done that for years. We will continue to do that. Next, you've heard about the BRAC road shows. Uh, in 2006, early 2006, uh, after BRAC 2005 had been announced, the Army came to the community and said, how can you help us recruit Department of Army civilian personnel to come to this area with the jobs that they are being brac for, if you will? The answer to the question was not only yes, it was a resounding hell yes, excuse me. But 31 organizations and 60 individuals spent two and a half weeks on the road at Indianapolis, St. Louis, Alexandria, Virginia, Fort Monroe, and Fort McCoy in an information exchange partnership with the Garrison Command to talk to Department of Army civilian folks about why they should move to Kentucky. Groups included education, home builders, hospitals, educated, uh, excuse me, elected leaders, tourism, economic development, realtors. Uh, they gave their time, talent, and treasure over this two and a half weeks with no funding. They did this on their own time. They did this on their own dime. We understand that, and I think we're correct in saying, no other community installation did this in 2006. And, yes, applause would be good. And, No other community installation did this in 2008. After we did, thank you very much. Thank you very much. A after we did the first road show, uh, there was some denial in the uh, Department of Army civilian personnel group who thought maybe this wasn't going to happen, that there was going to be another decision made. So we went back out on the road in 2008, and actually more volunteers uh, showed up for these road tours on the second road tour of 2008 than did in the first. And these people that are in this community and that are in this audience tonight, I know that you're going to be hearing from other installations. Mr. McLaren hears from 10 installations. You're going to hear a lot about emotion and how wonderful everybody is and how friendly we are. But these folks stepped up and again did something that was not done by any other community installation in the United States. And for that, we are internally proud of them and hope that you take that back with you. <laughs> Following that, in 2008, six months after the last road show, we initiated here locally what we called a regional tour where we invited Department of Army civilian personnel from these locations to come and visit. We planned on initially doing three of these, where again, they would talk to home builders, realtors, elected leaders, they would go to the hospital, they would see the schools, they would see the whole region, and Mayor Fishers had to leave, but we actually had a Saturday event for them uh, in Louisville. We planned three of these and did 14 over a two-year period of time. And not for this effort, but for the initial effort of the roadshow, as it says up there, this community, this region, was awarded the 2007 Active Base Community of the uh, Year Award. And I want to read that to you because I think this is probably at the crux of what you gentlemen are uh, about here. This award recognizes the active defense community whose efforts in building partnerships with a military installation have best enhanced that installation's ability to effectively do its job while enhancing the overall economic development of the community. I repeat, this award recognizes the active defense community whose efforts in building partnerships with the military installation 
have best enhanced that installation's ability to effectively do its job. Sir, that's what we're all about. It was awesome, truly. And I will say to you on a personal note, I've been in economic development and around community development since 1981, and this was the proudest I have ever been of communities and community leaders, and it was done for the right reason. It was done to support our military families. So for that, we are eternally grateful. And in the category of ongoing support, you heard earlier uh, from Mayor Fisher about where opportunity knocks. It was launched in uh, September this past year. It's a partnership between the Greater Louisville uh, Inc. Greater Louisville Inc. is the, the Louisville Metro Chamber of Commerce, One Southern Indiana, which is a like organization in Southern An Indiana, so it's a bi-state initiative, and also the uh, Hardin County Chamber of Commerce. And it is an initiative It's about developing a pipeline of transitioning veterans who are looking for a post-military place to live and to work. It is not strictly a job site. It is about, again, it's about mentoring and it's about a pipeline and networking for veterans. It is something that we think will be a model for the United States. That may be a hyperbolic statement, but we believe that that's gonna be true. And to conclude, uh, we have a brief excerpt from a testimonial that was done as a promotion for where Opportunity Knocks. And the gentleman you're about to see is not a veteran. He is one of the funding partners from Duke Energy for this initiative, and I'll basically let him express the sentiment that I'm sure just about everybody in this room shares. So if you would please video. I'm Pat Moore. I am the governmental and community relations manager for Duke Energy Indiana, and I cover the southern part of the state of Indiana for Duke Energy. I think of the opportunity to help out veterans is probably the highest calling that you could ever want. So, gentlemen, if the question is, how will the community support the Army Initiative, I think that I can say with full confidence, whatever it takes. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Now I'd like to introduce the Radcliffe Small Business Alliance President, Pam Ogden. Ms. Ogden. Good evening. Governor Bashir and the other briefers before me identified the big numbers concerning the economic impact of the Commonwealth region and the county. They identified the history of the roller coaster relationship we have had with Fort Knox, expansions and growth and reductions. Others have identified the military training value that is unique to Fort Knox. I am Pam Ogden. I'm the president of the Radcliffe Small Business Alliance. I represent 130 businesses that are within the city limits of Radcliffe. I myself am a small business owner. I have lived these impacts daily, daily for the last 10 years, and 18 years before that, working in the community. I am the face of the economy, the small business economy, impacted by Fort Knox daily. Radcliffe is here because of Fort Knox. We are primarily a service-centered business community providing necessary housing, retail, and personal services for on-post service members and civilian workers. Many of our members are veteran, women, and minority-owned small businesses. In anticipation of this listening session, we surveyed our members inquiring to the importance of Fort Knox in their business, as well as what impact the recent BRAC bubble and new reduction in assigned units, as well as the adverse effects recent installation decisions have had on their bottom line. The next slide. This slide provides, a fir uh, first, a general summary of survey responses. They indicate a heavy reliance, 30 to 90 percent, on Fort Knox customers. Many are reporting a 30 to 40 percent reduction in gross sales due to recent losses at Fort Knox. Not to mention the expe expected losses due to closure of Pat Museum and the Wilson Road Gate. Next slide. 
Below are some business owners who allowed us to cite their information. Notice the national fast food franchise that built a second location due to the BRAC, who is experiencing 24% reduction in gross. Next slide. The insurance business commented developers and property managers are having trouble meeting premiums due to high vacancy rates. Again, large reductions in gross sales. Next slide. Here is a more detail as to the effects of the reductions and the close, closure of Wilson Road. As you can see across the board, that gross revenues are down as are clients and customers. These are requiring labor reductions in many of our businesses. Not displayed here are the many developers and builders who have lost significant money due to overstated housing needs forecasted by the installation during the BRAC run-up. During this run-up, Brackleff approved many new subdivisions, multifamily developments. Many of these remain underdeveloped or, exper or, or are experiencing high vacancies. As is evident by these survey results, the local business community cannot survive another personal, personnel or mission cut. It also shows we are ready to welcome troops back to Fort Knox. And as others have addressed earlier, Fort Knox has great capability to accept wide range of missions and training. Let me just close with this. I'm an Army brat. I've lived here my entire life. My son has joined the Army, not because it was only his only option, because that's all he knows. He knows the military. Um, I've always, I always get asked whenever I go somewhere where I'm from. I say, Radcliffe, no one knows. I say, Fort Knox, everyone knows. The first question I get asked is, is it really gold in the gold vault? I don't know the answer to that. We don't go near it. We're smart. <laughs> I will say this. I just recently went to basic training. My son graduated from basic training at Fort Jackson. <laughs> Thank you. They had the soldiers of the, the basic on the front. They introduced them. They introduced different cities, different forts. And I will say this because I witnessed it. Fort Knox got a standing ovation. Everybody knows Fort Knox. In closing, this is our livelihood. Lots of businesses are hanging on, waiting for military to come back. We need some help from you. We, haven't, we didn't open in Radcliffe thinking that this was going to be the most lucrative business place that we could open. We did it because the military is all we know. Thank you for allowing me to put a face on the local small business owners severely impact, impacted by Fort Knox. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pam. And just one note, uh, Fort Knox's Patent Museum is not closed. It's open, but you have to come on to Fort Knox to get there. I just want to make that uh, statement, but thank you very, very much. Okay, the final scheduled speaker is uh, none other than our Hardin County Judge Executive, Harry Berry. Sir? Well, good evening. And again, welcome to Hardin County. It is certainly a pleasure to have you with us here this evening. As you can see, we are very excited to share information about our region with you and to make our case why missions at Fort Knox should be expanded, not contracted. Next slide, please. I'm a retired soldier myself, and firsthand I've seen the military installations across this nation. While many communities enjoy good relations with their neighbors, I have not seen a community more supportive of America's Army than Fort Knox, Kentucky. Here in Hardin County, we love our soldiers. We love their families and those working at Fort Knox to support our nation's military. Whether it's through an adopted platoon program or recognition of selected soldiers or a monthly Chamber of Commerce luncheons or from monthly community relations events with Fort Knox or our, hooray, our annual Hooray for Heroes celebration or with our designation as a Purple Heart County and Cities and our ongoing support for the Warrior Transition Program Hardin County is there for our soldiers and their families each and every day. Hardin County is among the largest in the state of Kentucky with a population of about 110,000. There are 15,600 veterans living in Hardin County. 
This places a veteran living in 40% of the households comprising Hardin County. Again, 40% of our households have a veteran living there. There are a large number of, veteran, or of retirees in this veteran population, and they rely heavily on Fort Knox each and every day for the many services that are provided and the medical support for them from Ireland Army Community Hospital. Next slide. You've heard from previous speakers regarding the recent infrastructure improvements the state and our community have invested to support the needs of Fort Knox, nearly $300 million worth of investment. Other initiatives are also moving forward, such as the $35 million worth of improvements to our health care infrastructure, including the expansion to nearly double the size of Hard Memorial Hospital's emergency room, plus the addition of 56 new private patient rooms. We are recruiting rock star level health care providers to our community and increasing the availability of outpatient services at more than 30 off-site locations throughout the region. Planning is underway to improve vehicle access at Fort Knox from the eastern portion of our county, like we have recently completed with the western part of our county. These improvements are focused on providing access via Kentucky Highway 251 and 434 through the South Boundary Road access in Fort Knox. And we are also working to extend Ring Road and I-65, which will provide even more options for access to Fort Knox and the regions surrounding us. And the widening of I-65 in our area is also programmed to help increase access and alleviate congestion from the growing demands in our region. The project cost for this is $88 million. Hardin County and the Commonwealth of Kentucky are deeply invested in Fort Knox, as you can see. We always have been and we always will be strong community partners with our neighbors at Fort Knox. You can count on that. Hardin County is Army strong. Last slide. Next slide, please. Now that has brought us to the point that the community is now going to speak to you, the members of our community. Let me stress at this point that these comments need to be, as mentioned before, only comments and not questions. Please be brief. Two minutes would be good, so others will certainly have time to be able to make their comments. And please provide your name and address, and if you're representing an organization, to give us that name as well, so if we need to get back with you later with you, about your comments, we can. And finally, be courteous and respectful. And with that, Colonel Edwards, I'll turn it back over to you. Hua. Thank you again, Judge Barry. Thank you very much. Okay, that concludes the scheduled briefers we have. And now we open, kind of like an open mic here, we open the microphone up for those community members that would like to come up and, uh, and speak. So don't all rush at once, but please come down uh, again, a uh, line of five or so. And again, as uh, Judge Barry mentioned, if you'd state your name and who you represent and so forth. Thank you very much. Go ahead, sir. General Combs, Mr. McLaurin. Gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to, to comment. Uh, I want to address three issues. I have many more that I will hand to Michelle to be placed into the record, but I want to concentrate on three things. Uh, my name is Peter Hill. I'm a resident of Meade County. Uh, I'm a small business owner with a business in Brandenburg, Kentucky, the county seat. Those three issues are land, justice, and money. Uh, things very dear to my heart, but I want to talk about land first. It follows from what Mr. Richardson said. You've heard from Governor Bashir, you've heard from state representatives, you've heard about how Kentucky, about how the Commonwealth is a user-friendly environment for the military and for Fort Knox in particular. That's very true, but locally, the local communities are also user-friendly communities for the Fort Knox mission. Uh, the Commonwealth requires every county to have a comprehensive plan and to revise it at least every 10 years. Fort Knox representatives are present and have input on that comprehensive plan in Meade County and in Hardin counties. Those plans form the basis for all the planning and zoning documents within that county. 
So there are Fort Knox representatives at planning and zoning meetings to protect the military mission and the military capability in Hardin County, in Radcliffe, in Vine Grove, in Meade County. You don't have that type of response, respect, and accommodation at many other installations. So I want to put it on the micro level, not only at the Governor Bashir Commonwealth level, but in the local community level, the missions of Fort Knox are accommodated by the local community. Secondly, I want to talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, justice, particularly the environmental justice provisions. You are required by law, the Army is required by law, to consider environmental justice provisions on minority communities and economically disadvantaged communities. We have those communities in our area. They were completely ignored in the environmental assessment, even though significant environmental effects may be disproportionately felt by those communities. I urge you to consider those communities. For example, Muldrow is an economically disadvantaged society, a little town, completely surrounded by Fort Knox. I don't know if that's unique, but it has to be rare. When Fort Knox sneezes, Muldrow gets pneumonia. <laughs> you need to consider those minority communities and economically disadvantaged communities to consider the perhaps disproportionately adverse economic impact on those communities. Finally, I want to talk about money, which is actually my favorite uh, topic. Um, also, with relation, uh, related to the environmental assessment that was done, in that assessment, contractor employees were nearly invisible. They were ghosts. They didn't consume anything. They never drove a car, never drove a truck, didn't breathe the air, didn't do anything environmentally. They were invisible. Uh, with Colonel Weaver, with others, I would implore you to check your metric. Surely that is not a reasonable metric by which to measure environmental concerns, nor would it be in measuring socioeconomic concerns. There are thousands of contractor employees at Fort Knox. Certainly they and their expanded economic impact need to be considered. It hasn't been considered to date, and certainly tens of thousands across the country. Secondly, the second part of the subpart on the money issue is this. Also in the environmental assessment, there were shortcuts taken in the analysis. Uh, we, the Army did not rely on salaries, it relied on average salaries. Uh, the average salary, for example, of a soldier in a BCT. That may not translate very well to Fort Knox, which may have a fairly high percentage of senior NCOs and officers, especially with the departure of 3-1 BCT. So an average salary is not a helpful metric to Army decision makers. I would urge you, as Colonel Thompson urged you, as Colonel Weaver urged, as many others have urged you, ensure the data is right. Ensure the metric is right. Get the good data to help the Army make its decisions rather than falling back on an easy, but perhaps very incorrect or misleading average data or improper metric. Thanks very much. Thank you, sir. Phil, go ahead. Good evening. My name is Phil Robel. I'm the uh, project director for Knox Hills. Knox Hills is the partnership between the U.S. Army and Lend-Lease Public Partnerships which is established through the Military Housing Private Initiation for Housing at Knox, taking care of the soldiers and their families, which were assigned to Knox since 2006. This partnership is based on a 50-year commitment for us to finance, build, rebuild, renovate, manage, and sustain the on-post housing community here at Fort Knox. It is a job that we take very seriously and one that we are honored to do for our military and their families. Knox Hills is comp comprised of 2,390 two, three, four, five, and five bedroom homes tailored to meet the family's needs of the military. Since 2006, we have built over 712 new homes which have been uh, energy built using geothermal fall heating and cooling needs. We have demoed over 1,129 homes and we have renovated just over a thousand homes. Our primary mission is to care, take care and improve the quality of life of the soldiers and their families stationed at Fort Knox. However, in order to maintain this necessary funding to ability 
to fulfill our mission during these times of low occupancy, the Army and Knox Hills have had to change and offer housing to select tenant groups. Doing so allows us to meet our financial commitments as well as our commitment to take other soldiers, their families, and all those that can call Knox Hills home. Knox Hills is facing a situation today due to significant occupancy challenges primarily associated with the Army downsizing and the 3-1 IBCT inactivation. So <clears throat> let me give it a perspective. In 2013, 45% of the 2,500 homes on post were occupied by the IBTC. In March of 2014, Knox Hills had 1,007 home, seven homes occupied by the IBTC. And today, only 5% of our homes are occupied by the 3-1 IBTC. Our occupancy is lower than ever before at 69%. And the saddest part is that our occupancy is most likely to fall to 56% by this summer. In December of 2012, we began renting select homes in the Johnson neighborhood to qualified DOD civilians and retiree applicants. In December 1, 2014, we began accepting applications from qualified civilians, regardless of military affiliation. Today, we have 155 DOD civilians, 33 retirees, and four civilians called Knox Hills Homes. These residents pay the equivalent of the established market rent for their home, are required to sign a 12-month lease, Additionally, all non-active duty are required to pass a criminal background and credit checks in order to quality, qualify and have the quality of life of living in one of our communities on Fort Knox. Beginning this month, active duty residents assigned to Fort Knox will pay either their full BH with dependent rate or if they select to move into a home designated for other tenant groups, the market rent for that house, whichever is lowest. In closing, these are unprecedented times for Knox Hills, but the impact of this loss of the 3-1 cannot be seen in our community. It can also be felt throughout the entire Fort Knox community on and off post. On behalf of Fort Knox and Knox Hills, in the partnership with the Army, we will continue to exhaust every option in order to continue providing the best possible living experience for our residents. As I said earlier, improving the quality of life for the soldiers and families assigned to Fort Knox is our primary mission. It is the job that we take very seriously and one that we are honored to do. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Roble. Yes, sir. My name is Master Sergeant Archie E. Ellinger. I put about 30 years in the service. Seven of it was in the 101st at Fort Campbell. I also was with the 11th Air Assault and the 1st Cav. I went to Vietnam with them. I know about light forces and everything else. I also spent 10 and a half years here at Fort Knox. I also worked for Lockheed Martin for three years. We game these things. Uh, I'm plugging for a striker brigade. It's the perfect fit here. We'll be remiss if we let it get away from us. We have all the equipment, the area, and everything, the housing. Some of these people out here, they build houses and apartment buildings and all kinds of stuff, you know. The people around here are pro-military. And I hope uh, you gentlemen on the committee up there will understand this here. But we'll be remiss. And here's another thing. I was, when I was in the 101st for seven years, they can't make it in the environment we had. I learned that over at Lockheed Martin, gaming them and everything. I was the aggressor. And uh, that's something we need to understand, but we need, uh, excuse me, if we have a striker brigade here, we can go down to Louisville, we can drive down to Louisville, the C5As can come in there, 747s or the, the C17. They have a limited number they can put out here at Fort Knox. We can, we can drive down to Fort Campbell and vote all on there. If the vehicles don't make it, it's the best thing that we find out now, not when we get in country someplace. Uh, thank you very much. Sir, thank you. Go ahead, sir. Um, my name is Andrew Hazlitt, um, and I didn't think I was going to be the fourth speaker up here today um, from the community, but thank you very much for coming here and listening to us. Um, 
I lived in a community that was affected by BRAC about 20 years ago. Um, and I'm watching some of the same things here, even though this particular one isn't BRAC, um, where a military community has invested an immense amount in terms of resources for infrastructure improvements and then turns around and walks away. And I don't think that's a very good use of taxpayer money. Um, We're talking about the U.S. government, the Department of Defense, uh, trying to um, reduce costs, if you will, find cost-effective ways to do things better. Um, and I think that we should continue to use the resources that we have here. Um, I echo a lot of the statements that have been made by all the, the scheduled speakers, if you will. One thing that I did want to point out, which struck me um, above the rest, I guess, is that uh, Radcliffe's Mayor Weaver noted um, some uh, statistics about the cost to have a soldier at a certain base um, and that Fort Knox stood out as being the most expensive right now. Um, if the quality of life on those other bases was made to be similar to what's on Fort Knox, would those costs be the same or would they be higher than what's at Fort Knox now? There's an immense amount of money that's been put in uh, uh, from the community as well, which has helped reduce the amount of, that the military has had to put into this. So I'd certainly hope that you take that into consideration when you're looking at any further cuts. And I really do think that the resources are here to bring other, uh, resor uh, other aspects of the Department of Defense here rather than leaving them somewhere else where they don't have the resources and the infrastructure they need. Thank you again for your time this evening. Sir, thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Hello. I want to thank you first for coming. I, would, I really appreciate you letting me come up here and speak to you. I am Carol Logsdon, and I'm the director of the Meade County Chamber of Commerce and Tourism. My office is probably about 10 miles from Fort Knox. We're on the other side, on the green side, the pretty side. <laughs> That's the tourism in me. <laughs> there are many things I could tell you about the wonderful relationship between Fort Knox and Meade County. I could tell you about the chamber leaders and the other Meade Countyans who have supported One Knox and in its many efforts to welcome and assist those who relocated through BRAC. Or I could tell you about the taxpayers and the elected officials and the other leaders who have carefully planned and financed our wonderful school facilities with over $15 million in part to support Fort Knox and its growth. But I would rather spend time at this microphone telling you about a little something more personal to me. I believe what we mean to you is important, but what you mean to us is just as important. In fact, I think it might be more important. You frequently hear about the quality of life our region offers to those stationed and working at Fort Knox, and there's no doubt in my mind that our region offers unmatched quality of life. It's truly a wonderful place to live, to work, to raise a family and to call home. I have to ask myself, what drives that quality of life? Is it the region's fantastic mix of urban amenities, beautiful green spaces, or maybe our award-winning K through 12 schools, the easy access to colleges and universities, the central location, rivers, interstates, and our international airport? And it is all those things, but more than anything, it's the people when I think about all the advantages our communities enjoy, I always come back to the people, and more specifically, to the people of Fort Knox. I can make this work. For so many decades, we have been blessed with citizens with military ties. People with a quality of character and enthusiasm for community that is unsurpassed. And because of the positive experience they've had at Fort Knox and in the surrounding counties, they have chosen to stay. In Meade County, we are proud of our home, 
but I doubt Meade County would be the place it is if it were not for the members of the military and the veterans who have loved it and still love it. The people brought to our community through Fort Knox have enriched our community. It's because of their support we've been able to accomplish so much. For example, I have the pleasure of knowing a retired Army Sergeant who recently joined my chamber, started a small business, and his business is growing by leaps and bounds. He's helping our local business community and our economy grow. But what's more, he has never hesitated to help others throughout the chamber activities or by serving as a mentor to other new business owners. I also think of a retired MP who is now working with our Camp Piamingo and our beautiful Otter Creek outdoor recreation area, which borders Fort Knox. She and her husband, also retired MP, chosen to raise their family in Meade County. They have become very involved with soccer, with youth, the youth camp, the other organization, and have proven themselves invaluable role models for our youth. I can tell you countless stories like these about the caring, intelligent, civic-minded people who have taken the skill and leadership of the military and put it to work at home in Meade County. Military retirees active duty serve, and active duty serve on our boards and lead our volunteer projects throughout our county. In our businesses, our schools, our churches, our civic organizations, and more, your people are there. I tell you all this to illustrate that we are very mindful of their contributions and thankful for their impact. Our leaders in Meade County look forward to supporting Fort Knox and the Army in every way we can but we would be remiss if we didn't take an opportunity to tell you about the value that the people of Fort Knox bring to our communities. In closing, we want to thank the Army for what the soldiers, the workers, and the families of Fort Knox have done here. Looking ahead, we thank you for your continued influence in making Meade County a great place to call home. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. And we do love Meade County. Meade County's beautiful. Right on. Okay. Yes, sir. My name's John Hicks, and uh, I'm not originally from here, but I got here as quickly as I could. <laughs> um, actually, my, my unit was transferred here in, in 92, and um, that was January 11th. January 12th, I bought my first house, and... 1995, I was caught up in the drawdown and I was put out of the Army. And then I joined the reserves. I had the choice of going anywhere. I stayed here. I retired from the Army in 2008. And there's no... Hey, sir, thank you for your service. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Megan Stith, and I am here wearing a few different hats. Uh, first, as a resident of the community by choice, a proud resident of Meade County for the last eight years, and chose to make this community my home after living around the country in different states, uh, even out of the country. I can guarantee you, having seen a lot of places, as I'm sure you will in your travels, you will not find another place like this community. But I'm also here tonight as a parent, uh, and to be honest, this might be the first time I've ever turned up an opportunity to eat birthday cake. Uh, my oldest son is turning five today, uh, and unfortunately I had to tell him that as much as I wanted to be home with him tonight to blow out those candles on his cake, that our community needed a unified voice, and I'm here on behalf of United Way of Central Kentucky, which is a regional organization covering Mead, Grayson, Breckenridge, Hardin, and LaRue counties, and on behalf of our over 170 businesses that work with us, from independent contractors to one and two persons uh, 
employee levels of small business up to some of our region's largest employers. Uh, those employers, those businesses have rallied with over 25 different nonprofits and over 30 programs. Many of those uh, funded, actually one being Hardin County Schools, an amazing partner of ours, Elizabethtown Schools, USA Cares, which is another veterans organization that's proudly in the audience tonight, and the American Red Cross, among those many partners. Uh, if you are looking for a, a community with infrastructure, not only to support the transportation needs, the day-to-day -day, uh, life that's required of an installation, but the human capacity and the human infrastructure needed to be able to provide that quality of life and that safety net of services for when those things that none of us plan for uh, happen, those job losses, those chronic illnesses, those things that none of us plan for but that any of us are susceptible to. We have the caring community, the infrastructure, and the capacity through our network of nonprofits, our network of businesses that have come together to say, and the reason we are all here tonight, we're putting aside uh, those children at home, those things that many of us could be, uh, could be at home doing tonight, because it's that belief that you have led us uh, by example in showing that we all succeed when we work together and that it, a weakness or a perceived threat in our community is worth our unified voice. Uh, we are here tonight to, to speak loud and clear that this community has the capability, we have the greatest resource of all. Uh, yes, roads, hospitals, all these things are important, but when it comes down to it, we have the people. We have the expertise, the passion, the resources, and the commitment to get things done. And as you can see, all the things that have been said tonight are proof that this is a community that gets things done and delivers results and takes care of its own. So on behalf of all of those organizations, please give us the opportunity to continue to provide high quality education, to provide jobs, to help get families on their feet, to give them that shot at the American dream that they deserve by continuing to invest in our community through an increased emphasis and growth at Fort Knox. Thank you. Okay. Wait. Thank you for representing the United Way. We do appreciate it. I do think that your five-year-old, if it's his birthday and he gave it up for Fort Knox, I got a military coin. Can you take it home to him? That'd be really good. Right on. Cool. Because Fort Knox matters and we rock, right? Okay, yes sir, please. Good evening, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak here, but I don't stand before you as a politician. I don't stand before you as a community leader. I stand before you as a servant, a veteran. Uh, I am a public servant. I also work on Fort Knox. I'm a 17-year veteran of the Vine Grove Police Department. I see my, my boss here, uh, the mayor. Uh, believe me, I, I'm sure I'll hear about this later. <laughs> Uh, but I can tell you that I could have lived anywhere in this country that I wanted to, and I left New York to come here to raise my family. I bought a home, and I've raised two children here. And I can tell you that now, as I work for Rivera Group, uh, a veteran-owned business, that I now have the lives of 60 individuals that I am responsible for to make sure that their jobs are there tomorrow. All right? And that's important to me, and it's an important mission for me. But as a public servant to my community, I can tell you that I have performed CPR on veterans in the middle of the road because this was the last place that they called home. And I don't want to see another citizen in this community have to go without that kind of a level of service to their community and see it gone because of realignment or because of reduction in force or anything of that nature. I think it's important that you don't take our homes away from us. This is my home, it will continue to be my home, and I will continue to serve my public. And I've spent close to $30,000 of my own money back in 98 up until now to run an organization to protect children online, and I've done that, and I've kept them safe and saved thousands of children. And Mayor Weaver is here, thank you. And Mayor Weaver, when he was in the House, and I have worked together to help establish better laws to protect our children. I didn't do that because it was something that I felt was relevant to one particular community, but I felt it was important to every community. Please make the right choice and the right decision when you go back to your homes and know that our children matter, our citizens matter, and our retirees matter here in Kentucky. Thank you.
Thank you very much, sir. Yes, sir. General Combs, gentlemen, thank you for giving me the opportunity to have a few minutes of your time. Uh, my name is Matt Self. I am the Military Liaison and Military Hero Voting Initiative uh, Project Manager for Secretary of State Allison Lundergan Grimes. She sent me down tonight to read this letter, uh, and she told me, Matt, do not deviate from this letter. But I work in Frankfurt. I'm a little fired up right now. Uh, I joined the Army in 1992, September, uh, right here, Fort Knox, uh, Kentucky, as a Cavalry Scout. I've been back and forth here for 21 years. I had all three of my children here uh, in the local hospitals, and they still go to school here locally. Uh, so I drive an hour and 40 minutes one way to work and come home to Fort Knox because I love it. And my kids, so when you go back to the Pentagon, my kids uh, have this catchphrase. They say, Fort Knox rocks. So don't tell Secretary Grimes I went off tangent here a little bit, but let me get to this letter. Uh, Dear officers and officials, I am deeply concerned about the potential impact the Army Supplemental Program Programmatic Environmental Assessment, SPE, for the Army 2002, or 2020, excuse me, force structure alignment will have at Fort Knox and the effects cuts would have on the base and the surrounding cities and counties. Our Commonwealth is proud to be home to the thousands of men and women stationed at Fort Knox, and one of my greatest honors as Kentucky Secretary of State is to serve as their advocate. I am strongly opposed to any cuts to this important installation. Fort Knox is more than just an iconic landmark. With an annual economic impact of about $2.8 billion, the military base is a driving force in Kentucky's economy. It is vital to both our Commonwealth and our nation. With the state's unemployment rate much higher than the national average, the Commonwealth cannot afford for reductions at Fort Knox. As part of the Pentagon's overall Army budget cut and force reduction, Fort Knox can lose an additional 4,000 military and civilian jobs by the end of the decade. These cuts could result in $500 million in lost payroll per year at Fort Knox and could disrupt the lives of roughly 4,200 spouses and more than 7,300 children. Furthermore, these cutbacks could put a severe strain on economies in the surrounding areas, which depend on Fort Knox's sizable population to fuel their restaurants, hotels, and other businesses. Today, I continue to urge the Army and the Department of Defense to reconsider and reevaluate these proposed reductions. This significant military installation is a vital economic driver in our Commonwealth, and cuts could be devastating for Fort Knox, the surrounding areas, and more importantly, the men and women that protect our great country. I am grateful for this opportunity to comment on the SPE and to voice my unyielding support for Fort Knox. Sincerely, Allison Lundergan Grimes, Commonwealth Secretary of State. Thank you. Mr. Self, thank you for your service, and please tell uh, the Secretary of State that we said hello from Fort Knox. She's visited quite a few times, and we appreciate her support. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Yes, sir, please. My name's Eric Bynum. I live in Radcliffe. Um, I'm not here representing anyone today, just me. I'm a guy that lives in Radcliffe. Um, interesting bit of trivia happens to be outside Fort Knox, which is the only U.S. military installation that is the focal plot point in a James Bond film. <laughs> How cool is that? Um, <laughs> Okay, all, all kidding aside, unless it helps, in which case take that bit of trivia very seriously. Um, I, uh, I was born in Texas. My dad was a tanker. My mom worked for APHIS. Um, we went to Germany for a few years, and then we got the, at the time, toe-curdling news we were coming to Kentucky. And uh, that was 23 years ago. We never left. People don't leave when they come here. There's, I, 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 a lot, of people, a lot of people have come up here tonight and tried to tell you why that is. I don't know why that is, but I'm still here, so. I'm living proof that something here is working. You should continue to invest in it. Thank you. I like the trivia angle. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, I'm not representing anyone either, except for um, I'm Mary Dunn. Uh, I live in Radcliffe. Um, I got here in 82 as a, um, as a dependent wife, lived on Chaffee Avenue here at Fort Knox. Um, I found myself seven years later with three children, three little boys, um, needing a job. I put the boots on and wore them for 10 years proudly. 
And during that time, about a year and a half after I got back here, I only signed the papers if they said I could come back here. I already owned a home here. I had three little boys, um, and I needed to come back here. So they, the Army let me do that, and I came back. About a year and a half later, I met my present husband. We've been together for almost 26 years, and together we combined seven children. Uh, our youngest, our, our second youngest, just uh, graduated basic training from, uh, with uh, Ms. Ogden's son in, in Fort Jackson. Cool. Um, and, um, and she is also a, a college grad and uh, came in as an E4. They weren't taking any um, OCS. They wouldn't take them. There's no openings for civilian officers. So she, she's doing that path. Um, but we also have a, our youngest son. My youngest son is also a lieutenant. Um, he went in as a private. We said, honey, you just don't do private. He was in the seminary. He goes, no, I've got the calling. I said, okay. And uh, about a year later, he goes, okay, I don't, I don't pull weeds. Uh, so he came back after 15 months in the, in the uh, sand. He came back, and he is now serving um, uh, a second lieutenant aide at uh, three corps at Fort Hood. Um, but I, I wore the boots for 10 years. My husband retired. And the story is, and, and he just said it, people don't leave here. So uh, we were in Korea. We had all of our children. I, I had our last child there at the 121 in Yongsan. And, um, and so we go there from 91 to 93, and um, about we're getting ready to de-roast back, and it's about six months out, and I'm like, okay, where are they going to send us, right? And they wanted to send us to Fort Riley. Had seven children, and we're like, no, there's nothing at Fort Riley. Sorry. And so I'm picking up the phone to DOD, and I'm like, okay, DA, I'm like, I'm not doing it. We're not doing it. The Duns are not doing it. My husband worked for a two-star over there. Um, I was in the battalion. And I said, you know, I said, we'll just do a third year here. My kids loved it. Our kids loved it. We loved Yongsan. We loved Korea. We'll do a third year. No problem. So his, 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 uh, the general signed it, General Henderson. He signed those papers. said, so you can stay a third year. So um, we're like, okay, we're settling in. And, uh, but I kept calling about every six weeks. You got a job? You got any, any spots at Fort Knox? We only wanted Huachuca or Fort Knox. And, and we had looked at the map and said, where can we raise our kids? kids? Where can we come back and settle down? Because this week's going to be our retirement home. Where are we going to go? We looked at the map. We said, rally, no, no, nothing there. Um, and so we're like, okay, Huachuca or Fort Knox. So I kept calling. I kept calling every six weeks. I said, you know, the Duns aren't coming back to the States. We've already signed. We're not coming back. No, you all go going to Raleigh. No, we're not. We've just signed those papers. We're not going anywhere. They finally, finally gave in and gave us Fort Knox. We knew this was going to be our retirement home. This was going to be the last move for my husband. I got out at 10 years when he got to his 21. Uh, started teaching. I taught eight years in, um, Fort, in uh, Hardin County. And I now teach... Um, I now teach broadcast. Wave 3 is my community partner. I've been tweeting out <laughs> to Wave 3 up there going, you're in the crowd. Um, and anyway, we, um, I teach broadcast up in, Fort, up in uh, Louisville. Been doing that now for seven years. This is where people come to stay. This is where soldiers know they are supported when they get out. They know they have a path. They know they have this. We have traveled to a lot of communities, a lot of military communities. When we travel back and forth, we always stay in naval, academy, naval installations, wherever we're at. Um, and I'm telling you, I'm looking around going, we have got so much here just sitting empty. They don't have to put a dime into it. Put the people in the buildings. Um, I mean, I, you know, I just left. I, it's there. It's there. And um, so I just want to say that we're collecting dust where soldiers should be sweeping the dust. It, there is no reason, and I've walked in, I just, we just dropped our daughter off at AIT, and I won't name the other installation, but I have never seen an installation that is a, a working installation right now that hasn't had a dime put on that installation and into the infrastructure for has to be more than 20 years. I have never seen, I've, I've just never seen barracks, I've never seen a PX, I've never seen infrastructure be so, I mean, I, I, it's obvious not a dime's been spent, and I'm like, why aren't these soldiers at Fort Knox? Why is not this base at Fort Knox? I couldn't figure it out. 
maybe their voices were, I don't know. But it was very, very frustrating to walk, you know, when we travel and they're like, oh, okay. And it wasn't Fort Jackson. I'll just say that. That's not where she's doing IIT. Uh, but I really, I just, I don't get it. I don't get it. We're here. It's there. The buildings are built. The roads are there. The people are here. The schools. You don't have to spend a dime. Just put them here. Thank you. We thank you for your comments as well as your family of service. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, please. Hello, my name's Larry Black. I'm an architect. I came to Radcliffe in April of 1974. And it was right after a very bad tornadoes came through the area and destroyed a whole bunch of Meade County and Brandenburg. And at starting work uh, at Fort Knox as the architect, I was amazed how the community responded to a major disaster that just struck its, its families, including the soldiers and their families. It reached out in support of them as reality. And that struck me from my very first day of being there to continue to be there. I've had 30 years of service to the Army. Uh, I proudly can say that. I was at Fort Knox and then at Training and Doctrine Command. Uh, my boss became Chief of Staff of the Army and I went to the Pentagon in 89. And I served there on, for, for the Office of the Chief of Staff of the Army as his architect. I was part of the BRAC committee, previous BRAC committee, providing the engineer input. So I understand the process that you're going through and the pain and agony and the tons of data you get, some of which are facts and some of which are feelings and some of which are just bull, and, and how to fit all that together and sift through it. But one of my jobs was, uh, General Bono was very adamant, if it's important, measure it. And so we, he tasked me to create a program called Army Communities of Excellence. The of excellence is my handwriting, if you look at that logo sometime. Uh, but from that, we measured customer service. We measured facility excellence and customer service excellence. We taught classes and got the Army's mindset. Like we were trying to ask, he kept asking, how come the Army is not as good as, doesn't have that perception as being as good as the Air Force? And the answer was because they measure it, they look at it, they demand it, and they expect it, and therefore they get it. But going from every installation in the Army, CONUS-wise, and a majority of them O-CONUS, from Aberdeen to Zama, you find places where people are doing good stuff. And part of my job was weaving that thread of excellence into the fabric of the Army and catching people doing things right. In Fort Knox, each year we made assessments for the Army Communities of Excellence program, for the Commander in Chief's program, I was the Army representative to the Department of the Army, to Department of Defense. Each year, Fort Knox had hundreds and thousands of people that were weaving that thread of excellence into the fabric of the total Army. They were a success each year, not because of some statistical data of measurable kind of things of dollars, but they were taking care of people and they were finding ways to do that regardless of the budget, regardless of the situation, because they cared about each other. And that was amazing to watch. Uh, I've been on some installations where that just didn't happen. You know, it was that good enough to get by mentality. Uh, here, here's what you need, soldier, that's it. But there was a human character of Fort Knox that you got to feel, I guess. It's hard to put in words but it's an emotional kind of thing. And they succeeded at doing that. One of my other jobs was I was a program manager for, for s facilities and infrastructure for the Army. That includes things like dams, roads, bridges, airfields. Fort Knox has some of the fewest problems of the whole Army structure in each one of those. Uh, we did a survey of Army facilities. This was a a million and a half dollar survey. So it was really scientific and measured uh, seismic concerns for the Army. We looked at every facility type the Army has and measured what's the seismic risk of just providing life safety for somebody to get out of the building and not be killed in it like they were at Fort Ord in 2002. But Fort Knox is at the low risk of that. The cost of that study to fix the seismic risk for the Army is $37.6 billion, that's with a B. 
in its real life, Fort Knox has some of the lowest cost of seismic risk. It's, it's a very far distance from it to the Madrid Fault. Majority of a lot of installations on the West Coast in Oregon, Washington, California, or in the uh, Pacific Rim or at high risk. And, and that just seems to me like a dumb thing to keep putting more Army facilities in those places where you're at very high risk of a seismic event. It's not if it's going to happen, it's a matter of what day it's going to happen. And people get killed. Um, I've had some experience when I was in the Pentagon one September day of having some good friends get killed, and that wasn't good. And it's not a good thing to go through that when other, it happens in other places. One of the things that the Commander-in-Chief Award of Installation Excellence, uh, another friend of mine was an SES, John Nurger. I don't know if you know John. Uh, worked with John for quite a few years. Uh, he had a, a compassion for finding excellence and finding that thread of excellence. And he was always very proud of Fort Knox and the things it was doing to take care of its people, its soldiers, and the family members of not just the, the family members of soldiers, but the family members of the civilians and contractors that worked there. Uh, in 2004, when we retired from the Pentagon, I had the privilege of managing the rangers at Fort Knox for a year, uh, about a year and a half. And that was an exciting time, from Zussman urban training site to all the other ranches. We did everything from cut grass to operate the computers and the targets and uh, keep everything kind of glued together. But those ranges, there's people that come here that you're not supposed to know or to hear from CIA and uh, some really kind of weird people that kind of float in and float back out of, you know, you won't show those up, they won't be on a report to you, but they get the best training they can get in the world at Zussman and they learn how to survive, and they learn how to go in and get people and get, bring them back out alive, and that's critical to the nation. Thank you. Mr. Black, thank you for your 30 years of service as well. Yes, sir, please. General Crombs, Ms. McLaren, or Ms. McLaren, uh, gentlemen, um, like just take a long view on things this evening. Um, you know, it's obvious we're drawing the Army down to 420,000 people. It's the lowest level since World War II. Um, history also teaches us that very likely sometime in the future we're going to have to draw the forces back up. Fort Knox offers some of, if not the best, training facilities, maintenance facilities, community support facilities, housing, and just an all-around training infrastructure that when that time comes will need to play a key role in bringing the Army back up. I don't know if it's going to be my kids, it's going to be their kids, but it's going to happen down the road someday. I would ask that you gentlemen consider that in your decisions going forward. Thank you. Thank you. I am going to give the 10-minute warning. I know uh, a lot of people's bladders are about had it right now, but uh, appreciate it. With a 10-minute warning here, uh, go ahead, sir, please. I'll try to take one. Again, thanks for having us tonight and this time to listen. My name is John Millay. I'm the superintendent of Meade County Schools, superintendent of 5,000, just over 5,000 kids that I'm proud to say have, on the state's accountability system, they've scored distinguished many years in a row. So I'm very proud of what's happening in Meade County and what that means for the U.S. Army. I just want to echo and repeat and reaffirm the words of our governor, our legislators, community leaders, business owners, veterans, and educators of how important Fort Knox is to our community. It, Fort Knox is the community. It is the heartbeat of the community. I look at the U.S. Army Strong Star there and I think of a nearly $15 million investment we just made in our community just a few years ago. And in that one new primary school that has over 500 students. The school is decorated on the whole theme of the U.S. military with the Army. I think of the words that are on the wall, perseverance, honor, valor. Our students see that. It's on the walls and it's embedded in the ceramic tiles in our floor. So it's kind of I'm proud of seeing where our students start from the primary, the preschool age, all the way through till we graduate them. In Meade County, though, we do pride ourselves 
in providing our students and our community with some of the very best facilities in the entire state and I would say the country. If you visit our schools, you will be so impressed. And not just Meade County, all of our surrounding counties. We're very proud of education. This entire community values education and that is very important uh, for national security. So very proud of what's happening there. We care about our families. Our, our school district, when, what we tell our employees and our students, it can be summed up in two words. And I think that's the answer to some say, why do people stay? It's because we care. We want all of our employees to care every day. We want our kids to care about their futures. And we certainly care about Fort Knox and what becomes of its future. So thank you for listening. Sir, and thanks for what you do with the, the children there. Thank you so much. Yes, sir, please. Well, I bet y'all glad to see me. <laughs> I'm an old retired sergeant major. Uh, been around Radcliffe the last 25, 30 years. Made my living off the fine uh, folks of Fort Knox and Radcliffe and the community. Uh, there's only two things I wanted to know. You know, we've already told you how great we are. Uh, Fort Knox has got a lot to offer. You all know that, you got all these notes. And, but, uh, and one thing that I wanted to mention was, we've had a lot of cuts, and we've had a lot of building on Fort Knox. We had a heck of a lot of building. They built houses over there. While y'all was cutting, they was putting roofs on houses, and they had to put tarpaulins on because they held up construction. Now, that don't make sense to me, but maybe it does somebody in Washington. <laughs> but the second point, let me finish, and then we'll go watch the Kentucky ball game. <laughs> On a personal note from a young soldier that left here from uh, the brigade that just left, and some from the 194th that left long ago, We're now competing with Fort Knox, those soldiers that own these homes. There we are in Afghanistan, places that I couldn't even pronounce. And in holes that you ain't never been in, and you wouldn't even believe it. But when Fort Knox competes, with that soldier that bought a home here and is in Afghanistan and his rent dropped from a thousand to six hundred and he can't make his mortgage payment I'd say somebody ought to listen if you gotta cut them cut them somewhere I've been through that too Vietnam we went through that same stuff. Then we real, pretty soon we built right back up. So it's coming. But the impact, I don't know whether all those facts were correct. But old Santa Claus said you better check them, you better check them good. <laughs> Thank y'all. Thank you, Sergeant Major. Sure, please. Uh, my name is Eddie Pankton, and I'm kind of up here. Want to speak on my dad's behalf? He's a um, he was stationed at Fort Knox in 1972. Um, he uh, went to the Vietnam War. He was a Purple Heart veteran. Um, we decided to come back here in 1988, and my dad um, bought bought my mom a house after he became disabled with Agent Orange, and uh, he opened up a business in Radcliffe, uh, which I own two businesses in Radcliffe, uh, one of which is Action Auction Company. I support the soldiers on Fort Knox. I do the auction for the Gold Rush auction, auction. And then I also own a pawn shop on Wilson Road across the street from Applebee's Easy Money Auction Pawn, in which I deal with soldiers on a, I dealt with soldiers on a daily basis, um, soldiers in med hold that needed money to carry over until they got their money or um, Soldiers that were, you know, just needed Monday money from paycheck to paycheck on the 1st and the 15th when they get paid. Then I have some retired 
um, sergeant majors and stuff that come in my store that used to chat with my dad and stuff. Anyways, uh, I'm saying on behalf of the Radcliffe Small Business Alliance and local businesses here, um, we do our best to support the military the best that we can on and off Fort Knox, as I do myself. And uh, I hope that you strongly consider keeping a community like this to support your soldiers. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have another speaker. Ma'am, go ahead, please. Thank you for being here. My name is Karen Ramsey. I'm a veteran and I'm an Army brat. Fort Knox was where my father, who will be 86 years old, went to basic training. I come from a family of seven children. Half of those were born at Fort Knox, the rest of us overseas. And all I want to say is that Fort Knox is more than a military post. It's home. It's home to a lot of us. Thank you. Ma'am, thank you for your comments. Yes, sir, please. This will be real fast. Uh, my family and I settled in here at Fort Knox, and whenever we travel someplace else and come back to this community, you know, there's kind of a sigh, ah, we're back home. And, and, and we have built dreams in this community. My concern has to do with all the dreams that you, you see out here in this audience and the people who are not here, who built their dreams based on this community, Fort Knox. No matter what the figures say, I'm concerned about the emotional impact in this community. When dreams turn into a nightmare, and when you look back over uh, the, the statistics dealing with activity in a community, and when it's, when it's bad economically, when it's bad in a lot of different ways, there's some fallout. There will be fallout. Well, the people become alcoholics, drug addicts, or fighting, whatever. There is fallout. And I hope, I hope nobody just writes this off as collateral damage. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, I'm going to go with a quick three count, going once, twice, three times. Okay, so... Uh, thank you all for, for the great, great feedback. I believe uh, we did give the Pentagon quite a bit to, to take back there. And, and sir, and gentlemen, thank you for uh, being attentive and listening. Um, before we close the evening, the Hardin County Chamber of Commerce has asked us to play a short video uh, as a way to recap some of the key points for the Army to keep in mind about Fort Knox and about this region. Uh, let's play that video right now, please.
And we thank the chamber for that video. Mr. McLaurin, would you like to say any final remarks before I officially conclude? Yes, sir. No, I would just like to take a minute to thank all of you who stayed, uh, to thank everyone who put such, put such tremendous effort into putting on this program tonight. Appreciated not only the comments of those speakers who were programmed, but the comments of everyone who came up to make remarks. We will definitely take those remarks back. Uh, they were all informative and more important heartfelt and concerned. Uh, I'd also like to take this moment to thank you on behalf of the Secretary and the Chief of Staff of the Army for all you have done, all you are doing, and all I know you will do for soldiers and their families, uh, and as you all mentioned, the civilians and other employees at Fort Knox. I and they, we truly appreciate everything that you all have done, are doing, and will do in the future. Thank you very much again for being here. Thank you for your comments, and most importantly, thank you for your hospitality. Good evening. Thank you, sir. And again, on behalf of General Combs, we, we do thank you for being here tonight. This officially concludes our community listening session. Please, please be safe getting home tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs>